my wife had an allergic reaction to the movie um, that that could have important meaning, and that is she when when he went and rounded up 50 kids, and it turns out the girl he was actually looking to save wasn't there, and he goes deep into the Colombian jungle. And, you know, did you see the movie? Did you actually yeah, watch the movie? Yeah, yeah. The odds of him dying looked like about a 98%, right? I mean, he, he it looked like a suicide mission trying to save her. And my wife had a conniption. She said he left a, a gigantic family back home. You know, he left children at home, and his wife says, go save the girl. No mom would do that, right? She, right. My wife said there's just something so wrong with that part of the story. Um, the the problem I've had since, uh, I was in a, I'm in a doctor Zoom group, and I mentioned that I was going down this rabbit hole to these guys. These are just doctors from around the world who, who united to fight the vaccine story. So they have no inherent tendency to go down rabbit holes. They all have it now, by the way. I don't know a single I don't know a single person who fought the COVID story, the the, the real frontline battlers, uh -huh. who, who isn't now also unbelievably dark about how the world runs. They 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 don't think they're just battling a vaccine anymore. They, they're all super dark. One of my asked, who I read his book against my better judgment because I'd read too much about COVID already, but. I asked him, he went down every rabbit hole. I said, were you prone to go down these rabbit holes? Um, and he said, well, I knew there was things wrong with the world, but I, I, it hit me like a truck what I discovered during COVID. So um, so in any case, I, I mentioned to this Dr. Zoom group that's got, has had all the famous battlers, Ryan Cole, Aaron Cariotti, uh, Bobby Kennedy, you name it, been through this group. And I mentioned I was going down this rabbit hole about pedophilia and its role in geopolitics. And the chat section of the Zoom group all of a sudden went bananas with links. And it turns out I, I was stunned by how many links these guys provided. And I'm pasting them into a Word document as fast as I can. And it turns out they were dark. They were super dark. And uh, and uh, and one of the things you run into is, is that there are people who think Ballard's not the good guy, that this is all a ruse. And you find out that the, the, the thing was funded by highly sketchy people and Ballard has connections that you go, ah, you know, ah. there's a woman named Liz Crocken who was supposedly mainstream press who then went up against this story and, and she's like sort of presenting herself as, you know, this sort of a soul warrior Whitney Webb type. And, um, and and then you find out she's on boards of these international save the children right. foundations which you go well that makes sense well actually it doesn't because these these organizations look like clinton foundation 2.0 they look like just big money laundering schemes to me uh, i don't think they're saving children i think they're rounding up money from governments uh -huh. Dave Collum, thanks so much for your time. How are you doing, man? Been missing you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of good. I got some health issues I'm wrestling with, but besides that, we're fine. Before I forget, uh, greetings from my lovely wife. I'm, I'm going to call her wife because we're not married yet, but I always call her wife. <laughs> Eva, uh, because she, she loves reading your stuff, she said, and so I just wanted to let you know. You know, I had a funny experience. I was up in the Adirondacks, as I told you before the podcast. Um, I'm in a convenience store and some guy says, uh, says, you from around here? And I go, no, I'm from Ithaca. He said, you Dave Collum? <laughs> I go, oh, <laughs> Christ. This is, I got to stop this. This is, this is getting nuts. <laughs> I saw the pictures, by the way, of your um, of your lovely dogs. How many dogs? How many new dogs do you have? Is that one or two? Four dogs total. But we also oh. have my son's visiting. He has two Boston Terriers. So we have in the cabin, we have a total of five Boston Terriers and a Labrador. Oh. Now, I'm back in my office. So um, so I just have the Labrador. Meanwhile, the Boston Terriers are all up there raising hell. So we just got a new Boston Terrier. Oh, this looks so sweet, Jesus. I used to have uh, uh, whippets, uh, yeah, but that's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the wind hounds, what do you call it? Yeah.
The what? Whippets. Do you know whippets? Oh, yeah. They're faster than fast. Yeah, I know. Like crazy fast. I mean, I think crazy the fastest fast. animal is, is the leopard or what do you call it? Gepard or uh, uh, gepard, leopard, leopard. Uh, uh, I don't even know what it was called. Like. I leopard. think they're like, I don't know how many kilometers power. But yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful aesthetic, you know, when you watch them like running anyway. It's like a cartoon character going over the hills. You know, <laughs> you go, oh man, that looks like Wiley e. Coyote or the road runner or something. Yeah. Yeah. No, I miss them. Anyway, um, Dave, um, I, I, I'm, I, geez, I mean, it's crazy times. Um, you know, every time we, we, we go into a rabbit hole and, you know, I've been, I've been like investigating and researching for, you know, different stuff, like, like you do, you know, like you've been doing for, for such a long time. And every time like, okay, it can't get worse than, than that. It can't get more criminal than that, more evil than that, more, I don't know, sadistic, psychopathic than that. And then, you know, uh, and then it does. It's like, you know, and you talked about like Whitney Webb, you know, last time on Marty Ben show. And I mean, I'm sure, you know, she, I think she's sometimes, she must have nervous break, breakdowns, but she, I think she, you know, she's so, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like so focused on her, on her, you know, on her job, on her research that I think she leaves the emotion aside. But I, I saw that interview you mentioned, you know, with Patrick, whatever, Pat David. PDB. Yeah, PDB, yeah. Patrick Bet David or something else. Exactly. He's actually from Iran. He's he's like me because I was born in Iran, so he was born in Iran. Uh yeah, so anyway. But um yeah, and and, and I saw her crying and it's it it uh it shook me to the ground because uh it made me, you know, again conscious and aware of what kind of shithole we are on this planet. So, you know, you talked about all kinds of stuff with, with Marty about this whole, and, and you know, I, I, it seems to me there are so few people, there's so much naivete, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, or just, I don't know, un, uh, under-informed or ignorant or not really um, able to comprehend the, the scope of it. You know, when you talk about this whole, I mean, s evil, uh, sadistic stuff uh that's been going on for actually such a long time you know whatever you call it uh you know pedophilia or pizza gate or all this stuff that's been going on i mean i mean you know and the, the point is uh it's not that it's just uh um it just it's so pervasive i think it's these are what are your words uh but it's so systemic and so rooted in the whole system I and mean, we'll talk about legislatures politicians media um Jesus Christ, I mean, judges, prosecutors, I mean, who's not involved in this whole system, you know, in the, I mean, in the upper echelon of this parasite, uh, parasites? Well, I think the uninformed part, I've been really trying to understand why there's this big divide. So, for example, I was talking to a friend of mine, and somehow the vaccine crossed our field of view, and she basically said, you know, you know, I believe in it, so we shouldn't talk about it. And uh, I, I, the question is, how do how do some people see that the vaccine has been a complete farce, at best, right? That's a generous term, and and others totally stand behind it. And and I think there's a host of pro, host of reasons. One is there's a little bit of a political divide, so I think the right tends to doubt the vaccine more than the left. Um, but that's just a bell curve shift. It's not a big effect, I think. Um, I think of your on social media that your worldview is just so totally different than people who are not. And so, and, and I don't just social media is not just Facebook. Something like Twitter is just so much more of a bombarding of your senses, and so you, you can't avoid stuff. And so I think there's that. And and the other thing is, I I think there's so many things that are so bad that um, if you haven't been sort of progressing towards an understanding, it's too much too fast. And so, for example, if you've been going along thinking that, you know, the Kennedy assassination was Lee Harvey Oswald and 9-11 was a bunch of Arabs and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden you get bombarded with Pizzagate and all that stuff. It just it's just outside your imagination. Um, the idea of, you know, people seem to be able to accept that child trafficking is a monstrous problem, but they don't seem to be able to wrap their brains around who's actually receiving these children. 
And it's not a bunch of pervs and trailer parks. They can't afford them. It's it's pe- men men of, I'm guessing mostly men of wealth and power, although there's some reason to believe there's women involved too. Um, and then you get the spirit cooking, which is just outside everyone's Overton window. But it's unambiguously true. The only ambiguous part is whether they actually eat r- real bodies or whether they whether they just eat make believe bodies. And I'm inclined to believe they eat real ones, and that we get the we get the make believe ones to sort of provide cover. We that's what you see on the internet. But uh, I'm I'm guessing there's a bunch of satanic sickos out there who are doing bizarre stuff. And I've been digging in. I was digging in before the before the sound of freedom showed up and that then accelerated my digging. So I, I, I don't know if you remember the Wayfair scandal where they were selling stuff online for like $12,000, you know, that's just an Ikea cabinet. What are you doing? And it appeared to be a sort of an advertisement for, for children. Um, they estimate that 800,000 kids are go missing in the United States every year. Yeah. Um, what do you that, think is the total number, uh, David? I mean, globally. Well, I've seen estimates at four million a year worldwide, mm. um, and the, the eight hundred thousand apparently does not include kids who we apparently we apparently have people who breed children, right? They're like a cash crop, and and they breed them and they do stuff with them, and um, and heaven only knows what. I, I it's a rabbit hole that going down probably will cause great pain. Um, and so there, there's a, there's a whole bunch that are not countable, and and then the question is who's going to count them? Um, if there's four million kids missing worldwide, um, someone's going to have to explain to me why we never ever see someone get caught receiving the children. You hear about the bad guys who are trafficking, but you never hear about the bad guys who are receiving them. Uh-huh. And that tells me that um, I wouldn't be surprised if half of Congress was doing it. I wouldn't, that would, I, that would, it would shock me, but not surprise me. How's that? You know, I mean, they're all black, blackmailed and extortable, um, pretty much. Well, the other theory, so I'm, I, I've been reading about the, about the, the child trafficking, because I've been, I've been struggling with the question of how do you get people to do things that just look so anathema to what they ought to be doing. So how do you get someone to sell out the United States completely? You know, the Bidens and the Clintons, and they'll just they'll just sell us down the river at, at a heartbeat. And and also, how do you get people to do things that seem self-destructive? You know, how do you get Prince Andrew to do a stupid interview, which he didn't have to do and stuff like that? And um, I, I think I think they're all under control. I think at times someone has to take a bullet for the team. And uh, and I I have this other working hypothesis and child trafficking would explain it. Right. So if you can if you can entrap, you know, the pervs who are in positions of power, you don't need to control all of them. You just need to control enough where they can cause hell for the rest. Mm-hmm. And um, and then. Uh, you know, you get someone like Cindy McCain saying, we all know about Jeffrey Epstein. Well, you didn't say anything, Cindy. Your husband didn't say anything, Cindy. What's wh- 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 Why do you think that's okay to say? Um, the other thing I'm working on is this notion that um, they're not entrapping people of power. They are corrupting people and then giving them the power. So you don't, you don't get the power unless you're already owned. With a few exceptions, I mean, would you say the Clintons are like inherently from beginning, like, you know, they've just from you know, sold out, not only they're sold, they're like so sick and so psychopathic, sociopathic and sadistic. You know, there's just a few exceptions that just, you just know, you know, there's no other way. I mean, <laughs> but right. gaining power, you know. But, but I, I mean, if you look at the U.S. war machine, how bad it is, um, I, I you know, the U.S. war machine could be a force for good uh-huh. if, if if it served as a true sort of bouncer policeman of the world, and it's the only it's the only country that ha- that can really reach any part of the globe. But I I think we're discovering that we're not invincible, and I think we're also 
anyone who's been paying attention for the last 20 years has discovered that we, we don't hesitate to kill lots of people for no reason, right? I don't know what your allegiance to Iran is now, but it, Iran keeps getting in the way of the United States war machine. And I, I have no reason to believe that Iran's the guilty party here. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me go back to you just mentioned uh, the Sound of Freedom movie because I, I just wanted to have your you know your more concrete take on that. I mean, the thing is, uh, you know, the alarm bells goes off when when somebody still believes in the official narrative or version of 9/11. And uh, you know, there are a couple of interviews with Tom uh, Tim Ballard, you know, the the guy, the protagonist who's being played by mm -hmm. uh, Jim Caviezel or whatever his name is. Um, and he, you know, I think in one of the interviews, he talked about like, you know, 9-11. And uh, I mean, he was talking about the official narrative. I'm like, oh, come on. I mean, it's, it's like so much overwhelming evidence now and, uh, you know, testimonies and this and that and uh, witnesses and, and expert opinions. And um, it just, I don't know. And the guy, I mean, worked for so many years in, you know, in, in uh, what is it, Homeland Security or <laughs> Um, and he's got the intelligence and the, you know, the investigative mind to dig deeper. I mean, isn't isn't that something like a little bit suspicious? <laughs> well, uh, when when I watched the movie, which I was surprised my wife went with me, I I don't know why she did because I don't think women like to go down rabbit holes the way men do. We go looking for bar fights, and they're usually trying to intervene and stop them. Um, my wife had an allergic reaction to the movie. Um, that that could have important meaning, and that is, she when when he went and rounded up fifty kids, and it turns out the girl he was actually looking to save wasn't there, and he goes deep into the Colombian jungle. And you know, did you see the movie? Did you actually yeah, watch the movie? Yeah. The odds of him dying looked like about a ninety-eight percent, right? I mean, he he it looked like a suicide mission trying to save her. And my wife had a conniption. She said he left a, a gigantic family back home. You know, he left children at home. And his wife says, go save the girl. No mom would do that, right? She, right. My wife said there's just something so wrong with that part of the story. Um, the, the problem I've had since, uh, I was in a, I'm in a doctor Zoom group. And I mentioned that I was going down this rabbit hole to these guys. These are just doctors from around the world who who united to fight the vaccine story. So they have no inherent tendency to go down rabbit holes. They all have it now, by the way. I don't know a single, I don't know a single person who fought the COVID story, the, the, the real frontline battlers, uh -huh. who, who isn't now also unbelievably dark about how the world runs. They, 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 they don't think they're just battling a vaccine anymore. They, they're all super dark. One of my asked, I read his book against my better judgment because I'd read too much about COVID already. But I asked him, he went down every rabbit hole. And I said, were you prone to go down these rabbit holes? Um, and he said, well, I knew there was things wrong with the world, but I, I, it, it hit me like a truck what I discovered during COVID. So, um, so in any case, I, I mentioned to this Dr. Zoom group that's got, has had all the famous battlers, Ryan Cole, Aaron Cariotti, um, Bobby Kennedy, you name it, been through this group. And I mentioned I was going down this rabbit hole about pedophilia and its role in geopolitics. And the chat section of the Zoom group all of a sudden went bananas with links. And it turns out I, I was stunned by how many links these guys provided. And, I, and I'm pasting them into a Word document as fast as I can. And it turns out they were dark. They were super dark. And uh, and uh, and one of the things you run into is is that there are people who think Ballard's not the good guy, that this is all a ruse. And you find out that the, the, the thing was funded by highly sketchy people and yeah. Ballard has connections that you go, uh, you know, uh, there's a woman named Liz Crocken who was supposedly mainstream press who then went up against this story and, and she's like, sort of presenting herself as, you know, the sort of soul warrior Whitney Webb type. And um, and and then you find out she's on boards of these international Save the Children right. foundations, which you go, well, that makes sense. Well, actually, it doesn't. 
because these these organizations look like Clinton Foundation 2.0. They look like just big money laundering schemes to me. Uh, I don't think they're saving children. I think they're rounding up money from governments. Uh You start running into strange characters like, you know, the guy who sold the balloon art for $250 million. It made no sense. Well, turns out he seems to be up to his ass in this stuff. Uh, I mean, there's a whole documentary on him. And he's got connections that you just would not want to tell your mother about. And uh, and then you go, okay, so the balloon art might be a money laundering mechanism. And uh, and as someone said, all modern art is money laundering at this point. So you know, Hunter Biden art, you name it. But but if you want to launder money, you just sell something for a stupid price, right? Right. And don't tell anyone who bought it, which is what exactly what the Bidens did. Exactly. Yeah. So, this, so I, I'm not convinced we know who the good guys are, even in that story. I'm not sure. I'm not sure Ballard's straight. I'm I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt until I get more data. But yeah. Um, I, there's I I'm thinking Mel Gibson was a good guy, but I don't know. You know this this idea that you know take one for the team. Maybe Mel Gibson for the last dozen years has been taking one for the team. Hmm. You know. And, so you think? Do you think it? So it could be highly possible that they're just forming a narrative and you know distracting and not really. Because mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. it's certainly some of that, right? Yeah, I mean, some guy, that, Jim Caviezel, the the guy you know also played the what do you call it, Jesus Christ superstar or whatever. Right. Yeah, uh, I mean, he talked about the CIA. That he's you know the CIA is uh, uh, the uh, biggest um, child trafficker. Or, organization but i don't know there's there there's a holistic there's something missing <laughs> there's a well holistic. i agree with that i agree yeah, with that of course and, yeah and, but it's much much bigger and you know the cia can take any beating you can hand out so uh-huh. hanging it on the cia in some sense is a potential cover-up because no one doubts the cia is up to bad stuff and if you tried to call them on it, you'd, you'd never catch them. You know, you can't touch them. So so they are a convenient whipping boy uh-huh. for anything that turns out to be evil. You say, oh, that's the CIA. Yeah, they do that shit. They're just, but no one knows how to stop them, right? You, you try to stop them from a position of authority, you get assassinated. Um, right. So I don't know. I It just, it's a dark world. And then the, there's I just finished um, Taibbi's book called Hate Incorporated, which was about a 2000, maybe 18 or 19 book. It's amazingly still timely, although things have gotten much worse. He talks about the press being so corrupted, so worthless, and he hammers both sides. So if 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 you can if you can prepare yourself to hear both your team and the opposing team, which is all just tribalism. Um, if you can handle that, um, you'll really enjoy his book. So if you're a Trumper, you know, he'll hammer Trump. But if you're a Democrat, he'll hammer the Democrats. And so I, I had no trouble with it whatsoever. I, I'm, I can certainly live with it. They're all bad model. But he, he goes into gory detail about the screw ups of the press and how they're just at this point completely worthless slash destructive. And he, he interviewed Chomsky at the end. And I'm... I've been kind of a Chomsky fan, despite the fact he's ultra left and I'm pretty far right, um, because I think he tries to get it right. But he totally boned the COVID story. Yeah, yeah, totally. He totally boned Very that. I mean, what is it? Is that is that out of conviction or is that like no cognitive no. dissonance? Or what is it? I, you know, I've, I've seen several people bone it and I, I, I've had this feeling they just didn't take the time. Right. Did you Chomsky get injected, by the way, Dave? Seven Did years old. Uh, did you get injected? Or, I mean, did you get? Yeah, I, yeah, I had to to keep my job. Oh, really? That was yeah. like mandatory. I, oh my! I wasn't going to quit on a theory, right? That's the problem. I, if I, even if I know, even if I know the odds now, mm-hmm. I, I think I would still take the jab rather than quit. I had too many years left. Yeah, and and the now it is possible that that we're all going to die early. I just had one of my former grad students, quote, died unexpectedly at 41. Mm-hmm. And the husband of one of my, my one of my current research associates 
uh, just keeled over in the living room one day. And, and that was clearly vaccine because he'd had heart trouble ever since his third shot. He had been the cardiologist. They were mystified. I'm going, would you please wake up? This is not that mystifying. Yeah. Well, he got the jab. He's having heart problems. We know this part. Um, and so, um, but even the odds, it's one of those things where you go, you know, when I get in the car, I do a, a risk reward ratio uh, calculation. Say, okay, I'm taking the risk to go to the store. And uh, sure. there's things we do, right? Sure. So I'd probably, I'd probably do it just to keep my job. You heard about the hearing in Australia where, you know, they admit finally it's not a conspiracy theory anymore that the Pfizer employees uh, uh, got a, a special batch. Um, oh. Was that the one where the guy kept asking him a question? Yeah. He kept refusing to answer. Yeah. Um, you know, the Australians were the worst. Yeah. And so I think there's some Australians who probably really are pissed off that they were the worst, but they they went full neo-Nazi. Um New Zealand was very bad. The United States was bad. They're never going to admit it. They'll admit little tiny things. You know, no, like, oh, they, uh, you know. they just sent out their patsies. I think, you know, a bunch of, I don't know. I don't know who these people were. I mean, it's not like there, there was not like a top level executive, uh, you know, CEOs answering questions. It just, I don't know who these people were. Right, but he just kept not answering the question repeatedly. Yeah. It was annoying as hell. You want to reach out and smack them. And uh, and and then for those of you who are who are not up to speed, um, again because it's it's drink this stuff is like drinking from a fire hydrant now. It just it just hits you uh, this full force. But uh, I, I, as of 2016, believe the climate narrative because I thought scientists were trying to get it right. Um, I am now a full climate denier. I think it is actually impossible to predict. I think it's mathematically impossible to predict the temperature in 2100. And I'm not alone. Especially you know, in connection with this CO, this whole CO fraud and hoax CO. I mean, CO. Well, that's the whole story, but we're, we're spending, we're going to spend trillions of dollars on it. We're going to, uh, we're going to, so, so with Marty, you must, you probably saw the Marty Bent, um, Rudy Havenstein podcast I did. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. and, and Marty said something that, you know, where he said, you know, they're going to, I mentioned the geoengineers trying to blanket the earth with, with a, a black cloud to keep the sun from getting in. And Marty pointed out, and then, of course, they're going to tell us we have to use solar panels to get our energy. And then I sort of jumped back and I said, yeah, and they, they basically outlawed all the gas generators that would bridge the gaps caused by the messes that these two planets. So, so it, the, I, I don't see the mechanism by which the climate grift goes away because you can always say well it's going to happen in 50 years right it's the perfect narrative in that sense because there's no i remember y2k um i went down that rabbit hole it took me a, a, almost two decades to to i think fully understand what happened so i believe that i i what, what y2k caused me to look into and become convinced is that this that the system is fragile if it starts cascading. So I had no way to know whether Y2K would cause trouble. I did know that once the trouble started, the cascading failures could be awful. And so I prepared much the way you would insure your house against fire, right? But, um, but I I I'm, I'll admit I was a believer. I mean I, I and 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 it was there was nothing. So the whole thing was wrong. 100% wrong. Yeah. And and then the question is, what was that? And what it was, was a grift by Silicon Valley. They sold tons of computers and software. Gee. So the whole thing was just one of these grifts. And uh, that was the actual story of Y2K, is, is that they they upgraded every goddamn computer on the planet. Oh, my God. I didn't know that. Okay. I, I thought bet you hadn't thought of that. I bet you hadn't thought about that. It was okay. a great grift. Uh -huh. But I, for example, I, I mean, I reached out to everybody. So my former roommate in college um, founded Goldman Software Group. Uh -huh. And and he didn't know what was going to happen. And so here's a guy who was on the pinnacle. And, and he was the guy who actually got me nervous about it because he's, it was like 90, late 97. He said, well, if you haven't started the fix now, it's too late. And I, 
and and he has no reason to lie to me, none whatsoever. Right. And um, and so he clearly thought that it was meritorious that 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 computers were being fixed. But the fact that nothing happened, you can you can say, well, you know, I, I have a friend, a fraternity brother who is who is a CEO of a software company. And he said, well, we fix. I said, no, we did not fix it. Because if we had fixed it, there would be pockets of failures, period, period. Because I can guarantee you not everyone fixed it. I guarantee you that's true and nothing happened. The guy named Jaeger, who was the Y2K whistleblower, sort of ringing the bell saying Y2K is a problem, around six months before the rollover, flipped his story. Said we've solved it, it's not a problem. And I remember the Y2K doomers were felt abandoned. There was this chat board called uh, Time Bomb 2000, which was the number one chat board. And you could actually see the intelligence guys there at the chat board, because there's this guy named Dexter, I think it was. Decker. Decker. If anyone remembers the Time Bomb 2000, Decker will ring a bell to them. Decker was this guy who would never argue, but he would simply put up counter counter arguments to everything everyone said. So if someone said this chip's going to fail, he'd come up with all this detailed information about why that chip's not going to fail. And after a while, it became pretty clear that Decker was not just one person. Decker was a was a consortium of, of experts, probably in some brain, some probably in, in the uh, Y2K headquarters, which they built. And it, the job of this panel of experts was to calm us the hell down but at the same time, sell computers and software. So, so that was a big rift. Gee, what a big thought. <laughs> so Dave, what's, what's on your radar? I mean, if, um, is there something like really uh, makes you worry? Like it's sort of a precipice of if we can't make this like, uh, you know, in a time, uh, you know, on a timely fashion, like on a timetable, you know, would it be, I don't know, geopolitics or, um, uh, I mean, is hyperinflation, uh, you know, uh, avoidable <laughs> or well, uh, world war? What about world war? I mean, <laughs> are we are we gearing up for for war or what is? Here's this? what I, I here's what I can't even tell you for sure. I can't even tell you if if the United States and Russia aren't actually cooperating. I was just thinking about because you you posted about the Rush, uh, Russian and Chinese vessels or whatever you call it. Uh, a uh, naval yeah uh, a flotilla is heading yeah, going, for uh, where alaska or is, something right is this like a theater i mean is, is that like a yeah and because you know you can't fight a world war three because they have such highly advanced hypersonic weapons and defense technologies even iran you know i mean uh, what are you going to do with ships i mean I, I was thinking like maybe they were trying to protect you know their uh, uh territories of you know, mining and, uh, you know, uh, exploiting natural resources, you know, like sort of as a, as a, as a, as a backup for, for this, you know, for the, for the commerce, for, for trade, for whatever, but I don't know. What's your take? Well, um, the Ukraine war, assuming that they're not working together to create the Ukraine war, which I don't have any evidence of, but I've just my my Overton window is now wide open. I unless something defies the laws of physics, I can entertain it as a possibility. And 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 um so let's assume the Ukraine war is a legitimate war and we're not just killing Ukrainians for laughs to get Russia, China, and the United States to get what they want. Um it's it's a horrific war. Some of my best writing I think I've ever done was last year when I wrote about the Ukrainian war because right. was the story was that you know Putin's bad, he's a madman, Ukrainians are a bunch of good guys, and and that was the narrative across the Western press, and nothing was allowed past that. Nothing was allowed past that. And I found the offbeat um, voices, probably forty of them who were telling the other side of the narrative. And I noticed right away there was something wrong with the war story, right away, because we were hearing about how horrible the war was, but there was no Saving Private Ryan footage. There was no Baghdad Day One footage. There, there was no 
no evidence of massacring. There were a lot of stage things. Um, there were, uh, I kept saying to my wife, this isn't a war. This is not a war. And, and, and it drove her nuts. And I said, look, uh, the footage we're seeing is a bunch of grandmothers bitching about the war. We're not seeing the war. You see an explosion that's 10 miles away and you can't tell what blew up, right? You see cars burning in the street. Cars burning in the street is not a war. And um, so I think at first it was not a war. It was Putin doing a military intervention. And I believe that he was forced to do it. It was his best play. I believe that NATO wanted him to do it. I believe that NATO is the provocateur. I think that we should be sending weapons to Putin, not to Ukraine at this point. Uh, I'm just so pissed off at this whole thing. So in any event, so I found about 40 voices that were trying to get at the truth. And what I did was, is I, I wrote a coherent, I, I think it was coherent, narrative, the alternative narrative. And these 40 voices were all fantastically good sources, best I could tell, but they were not bringing it all together. So I, to the best of my knowledge, when I wrote it, when I published it in December, it was um, it was the almost the only thing of its kind at the time where I was pulling all the counter narratives together and 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 describing the absurdities of this war and you know, things like the Azov Battalion. The CIA was funding a bunch of neo-Nazis who were slaughtering, you you know, ethnic Russians in the Donbass, right? These guys were bad. These guys, these guys, my, my analogy is these guys are like Mexican drug cartels. There's not that many of them, but they're lethal. And we funded them and we encouraged them. And, and, and you know, Zelensky tried to get out of the war. And then we said, no, you don't. And so he went back into the war. And so now there's what, a half a million dead Ukrainians. But we don't care because that's, that's not our job to care, apparently. Our job is to piss off Russia. That's assuming that's our job, right? Um, and, you know, Putin just grabbed some journalist. Um, in the United States is trying to shed fit. If I were Putin, I'd grab every American I could get my mitts on in a heartbeat. I would just find all the Americans. I'd scoop those bastards up and lock them up and say, okay, now let's talk, you douchebags. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, of course, Zelensky just picked up Gonzalo Lira, which I'm not sure I believe is true. That'll come off as odd to some people. But Gonzalo, at one point, he is an American journalists over in Ukraine talking about how farcical the war was. But there's something showman about him. There's there's a showboating quality. So then at one point he said, you know, if, if I disappear, blah, 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 you know, and then he, then he reappeared, you know, and you're going, okay, he's building a brand or something. But he supposedly got scooped up by the, by the Ukrainians. And our State Department couldn't give less of a shit about it. And 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 they got challenged the other day, and he just said he just wouldn't. The guy wouldn't even comment on it. But then Gonzalo, um, Gonzalo says, um, you know, they they left the keys to the door open, and I'm told that this is what they do, and they really want you to just get away. And he says, I'm heading to the Polish border. I hope I get there. You know, he's showing footage. He's he's live tweeting his his escape and then next year he gets picked up and i go well dude you, first of all you should have shut your mouth and second of all i'm now starting to wonder if any of this story makes sense because if i got away the last thing i'd be doing is live tweeting my escape before i got to the border oh, that would be yeah yeah wasn't it like so that between what his wife said and i think uh something with before and after some i don't know there was some kind of contradiction and like it was blatantly obvious you know that they were lying but anyway uh zelensky's wife i mean you know um <clears throat> so in any case so the the geopolitics is scary um last year i think it was glenn greenwald wrote an article about the danger of having a u.s administration which is not run which is not headed up by a single strong voice mm -hmm which we've never had before. We've, ne we've never sensed that the president had no say whatsoever. And, and now we, we know this. And, and the problem is, is that, you know, imagine if we had the Cuban Missile Crisis and Biden was there instead of Kennedy. What, what chaos would ensue, right? At least we had, and I think 
all of our previous presidents had enough chutzpah to be able to play the role of, okay, the buck stops at the top. I'm making the call, but not Biden. I don't think Biden has that. I think he's out of his gourd. Oh, uh, okay, what about Trump? Do, I mean, is there is there a, some truth to it that Trump could still be playing some kind of 4D chess game with uh, in uh, in the process of what do you call it continuity of governance or something like that and having some kind of wartime commando uh, you know because of his executive orders that he had signed is is there some truth uh, about that or or do you think it's just a bunch of the Trump uh, story is the Trump story is so garbled that I I just it's very hard to make sense of any of it so so all the indictments look fraudulent to me. Um, to indict a, a former president who's actually running again and therefore really should be kind of hands off um, is insane enough. But but if you look at what he got indicted for, their absurdities. So they're 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 misdemeanors. They're you know the things that Biden is accused of doing are way worse than anything that Trump is accused of doing. It's totally ludicrous. I mean, they have we weaponized the, the total, I mean, the, the entire justice system and the, the, the judge, I think, presiding in over the J6, whatever trial is actually, she's actually from Puerto Rico. Isn't she from Puerto Rico? It's like totally buys and was working for a client of Burisma or something like that. Is there some kind of uh, mm -hmm. truth to yeah. that? Yeah, anyway, it's, it's well, so 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 the problem is I've not seen a shred of evidence that Trump actually encouraged any insurrection like that. It wasn't an insurrection either. They, they forgot the goddamn guns, right? Yeah. They didn't bring a single weapon with them. So it's really hard to call it an insurrection. It was what I call a violent protest. And, and also you got the 50 FBI guys running around. I even documented that there were Ukrainian nationals running around the crowd. So I think we brought in some Ukrainians, some Azov guys to cause trouble. Right. And 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 um and uh and and then they're disposable, right? I don't know if those guys survived the day, right? They might have been capped when it was over. But um so 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 put it this way, I'll take January 6th over the George Floyd riots any day, right? They did so much damage, they killed so many people in the the, the the George Floyd riots and and yet somehow that was totally state sponsored, completely state sponsored. Um, January sixth was the greatest political reversal I've ever seen. So they went into it in sort of a crisis mode because because I I, I still very much believe the election was rigged. I, I don't yeah. have any problem yeah. with that. It's it, become obvious. Yeah, and yeah. well, and it's not just the data supporting the theory, but it's also they did everything within their power to keep Trump out of the White House, but you're going to tell me they ran a straight election? I don't. I don't believe it. I, I don't believe it for a second. I, I would. Be, I would hate to have to take that case in a debate, right? If you gave me the, you know, I, I'd get annihilated. And so, and then there's stupid things like, you know, he'd been indicted in Georgia for election interference because he supposedly said he needed eleven thousand votes. That's not what he said. What he said was, we need to find 11,000 illegitimate votes. And that's a completely legitimate thing to say, because we say, look, if we find 11,000 illegitimate votes, then Georgia flips. There's nothing illegal about that. There's nothing bad about that. It makes total sense. He didn't say, go find me 11,000 votes. He said, go find me 11,000 illegal votes. But somehow they've forgotten to mention that part. Mm -hmm. And so... And if you want to blame the Democrats, that's fine. But I don't see the Republicans defending them. I think the Republicans and the Democrats both agree that they don't want them near the White House. And what appears to be support for Trump is coming from politicians who are just terrified of losing the MAGA vote. Mm -hmm. Right. If you if you turn like Pence, for example, Pence, I had as kind of a front runner for 2024 to run. And then he turned against Trump. He's done. He's sold out. I mean, the guy is such a... Such but a, even if he took the right... Even if you call, accept it as the right path, he's finished. Yeah. Right? He lost the MAGA vote. Right? That would be... Um, and so so, so you see a lot of pro-MAGA types. Um, 
who's the American president who got filmed in a tank? I know your listeners will hear and go, yeah, whatever. He got filmed in a tank and it looked really stupid. Um, um, and and um, that's kind of what DeSantis looks like to me now. He, yeah. he looks like he just can't. He he can't find the hearts and minds that Trump finds seamlessly. Yeah, I, and I have the impression the Santis is I don't know somehow ruled by controlled by his wife or something. <laughs> I don't know. Is some, some stories well, she's going? She's hot. She can own me too. Um, yeah. But she but but he can be totally straight, politically honest and stuff like that. But he can't seem to find the the sweet spot. Uh, unlike someone like Kennedy, for example, but they're not going to let him near the White House. They they will cap his ass before they get, let him near the White House. Yeah. Mm. So, so, but he, 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 he is did. getting near microphones, yeah. right? Uh -huh. The message is getting out. Yeah. And that may be what his goal is, just to be at the microphone nonstop. Yeah. He's been going on a big tour now. I mean, all, all the major podcasts and uh, I mean, I really respect uh, Kennedy. It's just uh, one or two, I don't know, taboos that he can't talk about. But I guess it's always with every president. You know, he can criticize this and that. But anyway, I'm... Uh, no, I'm, he, I think he, he yeah. gets criticized for his climate change views. But I listened to him and he has said in podcasts, and let's, let's assume that he's trying to be honest and therefore consistent, that he said that climate change, the problems and the solutions should be identified in the free market. Mm -hmm. I can live with that. I have no trouble with that. If you like, the, the problem is that the whole climate change narrative has nothing to do with free market capitalism. You know, they're not, they're not building windmills because they're cost effective. They're not the, 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 I reached out to an energy security analyst one day and said, has anyone done a soup, you know, cradle to grave analysis to show whether these alternative energies could possibly achieve what they say they're going to achieve? And he said, yeah, I think his name guy was David Way or something. He said, I think David Way did it. And basically, um, David Way says, no way, no how. It's just a farce to think that we're going to. So we got to go to nukes. In 2021, I said that we would we would have a, a uh, an energy crisis. Mm -hmm to win the hearts and minds of those who don't support nuclear power. And boy, it started to look like one in 2022, didn't it? Or 2023. I can't remember what year I wrote it, but um, it, it, I think it was spot on. I mean, I think they're going to send us through a couple of cold winters and then say, well, you know, we could give you nuclear power. Right. And, uh, I mean, I, I live in Austria and, you know, um, and Germany, the neighboring country is, uh, I mean, they're they're definitely intending to destroy Germany. I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's just suicidal what they're doing. You know, decommissioning nuclear reactors and and uh, uh, it's why? It's why? So this gets back to this question of why would someone who should have sort of a foundation level belief in their nation, why would they throw their nation under the bus? I mean, that's what? just treasonous, right? This is beyond treasonous. I don't know. Do are they are they are these people all? I don't know. Are they all just sold out, or are they all uh, blackmailed? Uh, and well, so so I was the 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 new world order sort of model is looking pretty good, and I was listening to a Douglas McGregor podcast about every couple of weeks i listen to mcgregor because he gives us updates on what he sees going on in ukraine and he started talking about the new world order so mcgregor is hitting the rabbit holes too and this is a very elite colonel and a very scholarly guy and he was talking about how um it's clear that the united states stands between the the globalists and their goal right so and, and in particular, I think I think the globalists know they can buy off the rich and they can step on the poor. But the, the U.S. middle class has a kind of a unique tenacity to it. Yeah. And, uh, and big and, and it used to be powerful. So they have to destroy that. So they say what they do. Well, COVID lockdowns, you know, transgender battles, you know, George Floyd riots, you know, just everything. And and he was talking about how. The Ukraine war is about bringing um, 
bringing Putin to his knees because he's one of the last of the great nationalists. Mm -hmm. And so he's he's clearly gone down that dark hole. And and I, I was a little surprised by it. But yeah, because, you know, Dave, I mean, whatever we, we want, I mean, you know, I, I don't have any faith or trust in any kind of political or whatever conventional structures, but whatever you want to think about Putin, I mean, the guy is, uh, is still, you know, his traditional values, he, he I mean, uh, he's he's rational, he's logical, and he's coherent in his argumentation, and he kicked out, it, didn't he kick, kick out like George Soros and the types of, you know, and... Uh, uh, throughout all this LGBTQ and trans whatever thing, I mean, mutilating children, all this, uh, you know, he he just said no, you know, no to all this bullshit. So uh, there seems to be some kind of decency and and, and traditionalism uh, of values, you know. So without underplaying his potential ruthlessness, which we also know exists. So, but right. you know, it's not like Justin Trudeau could run Russia, right? So. Um, with that said, I actually think he is the most impressive of all the global leaders. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably on some FBI watch list for all the shit I say like that. But um, I think he I think he's incredibly coherent and incredibly rational. And, and he can really, really hit the bullseye when he decides to come in with a statement. Uh, his they're they're unbelievably yeah. in a wild moments when he when he decides to. To, to and that, that's somebody. that's the reason for censorship. I mean, you know, there is no Russian Russian today, and you know, you I mean you have to look it up, like really go deep in the rabbit hole and find those links and sources and everything. But there's a reason, you know, there is no uh, Russian, you know, translation or or media or reports or you know, I mean, because they know, you know, you could get the facts and. Or the other well, side. The other funny one was the Pergozin, the Pergozin uh, coup, which I think was a complete staged coup. Mm -hmm. I reached out to a guy who's done a lot of tours of duty as a national security analyst, and I said, "Is there any chance that Pergozin is actually defying Putin?" He said, "There is zero chance." Hmm. He said, "He said, you know, consistent with what I said about Putin." people who defy Putin at that level die. So one of the things that it did is that, that by, by Pogosin supposedly going against Putin and, and moving his army in theory towards Moscow, um, it turns out Pogosin was able to move his army within 100 miles of Kiev, supposedly. Mm -hmm. I think I have the number right. I, I don't really know. My geography sucks. And... Um, and so it was a way to move his troops with the, I, I don't know if the, the West fell for it or if they just said, well, there's nothing we can do anyway, so we'll pretend. Um, they love the anti-Putin stories, so pretending the Pergozins against Putin. But um, but now they're talking about, yeah, I read articles about the Wagner group, um, you know, sort of threatening Poland. I go, oh, of course they're threatening Poland. Right, we've put him in a position to threaten NATO. Uh, that's that's the way it works. You pick a fight, you get a black eye. So, um, if you know foreign nationals are over there fighting, I, I don't want to read any stories about Americans who've been killed in Ukraine. Yeah. I, I I feel bad for the families. I feel bad for the the soldier who fought the the wrong war. Really sad. Really but fun. it's like when that guy went to North Korea and came back in a box. That was a Darwin Award, right? Mm -hmm. There's just you go to you go to Ukraine to fight, uh, get ready to die. Exactly. Because yeah. that's what's gonna happen to you. Yeah. You just fought him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and the and they we destroyed Ukraine and we didn't have to. Putin had no intent intention of destroying Ukraine. He didn't want to have to rebuild it. Exactly. Yeah. And he still wants to. I think. He, I mean, the, I think that's the long-term strategy. Not to. He might, you know, take out all the, you know, logistical, whatever military logistical intelligence uh, uh, centers. Uh, would you agree? I mean, well, the other thing is he he has decided it, it got real when they took out the pipeline and the Kerch Bridge and things like that. And so Putin said, "Okay, okay, I guess we're going to have to fight this one." Mm -hmm. um, 
but I still think he was, he's actually careful. He's taking out infrastructure to Ukraine, but he's not destroying it. He's just taking out choke points. The kind of choke point where it won't take a lot of money to replace it. So he's basically with bombs, shutting off valves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm appalled by the, by the Ukrainian idiots. I'm, I'm appalled by, but these are the same idiots who, who actually are proud as hell that they drive an electric vehicle, ignoring the fact that the cobalt in their battery is being, being mined by ch child slave labor in the Congo. And uh -huh. so I feel good about your, your, your electric vehicle, but you're being built with slave labor. So, you know, you can eat shit and die on that one. So uh -huh. I'm, 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 I get, I'm getting less patient with ignorance and I, I may be wrong, but I'm trying like hell to get it right. I'm trying like hell to find the facts. And the one place you won't find it is on any of the, the news shows. Tucker Carlson. Yeah. But they dealt with him. What do you think about Tucker Carlson? I mean, is he, is he like, is he is super he real? Is he like super ethical? I mean, super, or what is I it? I don't know. Uh, you know, he's the most uh, convincing fake. If if he is, I, I have some thoughts on him getting fired. I, I I watched the show and noticed an increase in intensity leading up to his firing mm -hmm. over a number of months, and he started dropping truth bombs that were the kind of gone. Oh boy, Tucker, you know. So he starts questioning whether Nixon got taken out by the CIA and starts talking about whether nine eleven was really done by the Arabs. And these are these are third rails that the authorities do not want to see touch. So I somehow have this feeling that he decided he was going to trigger his extrusion. Wow. Mm -hmm. and, and and he had to force it because he had to force them to break the contract. Mm -hmm. And didn't he okay. talk to to uh, the J six uh, a police uh, chief of whatever you know? Of yeah, who said the whole thing was bullshit. Uh huh. Yeah. But we all know that, right? Yeah. That you know, yeah. we know that Ray Epps is a Fed. We exactly. I mean, if you don't know Ray Epps is a Fed, you got to wake up. Uh -huh. and, and and if you don't know that that people were in solitary confinement simply for walking through the rotunda, you know, you you just got to wake up. You just you're. And if you don't know that Julian Assange is, shouldn't be in prison for the rest of his life, he's a journalist. He was a journalist, and he's a journalist that the authorities didn't like. Uh -huh. um, they just forced some woman who worked for one of the major networks. They're saying that she has to give up her sources. And it turns out it has something to do with a, a Chinese agents or something like that. And I go, but that doesn't allow you to make her give up her sources. You got to figure out who the spies are on your own. You, you, you don't get to tell, well, and it'll be really interesting to see if she hangs tough and if her network backs her and things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, we are becoming what we profess to fight. And then I, Chomsky, I'll go back to Chomsky and, and Taibbi's book. He interviews Chomsky at the end of the book. Chomsky seems to think it's not worse now than it's always been. He seems to think there's just, we have a different view of it. I've, I've it? wondered about that. Really? He said that? Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm, I worry he's a little, I worry he's lost his game. Uh -huh. I do worry about him. Um, I mean, he's ultra radical, but you know, like Chris Hedges now, you know, I made a list of people who, who um who I'd like to hear more from. And I realized that most of them were former liberals. Mm -hmm. I'm not a liberal. I mean, I'm uh, but but I I'd be a liberal, I'd be an old school liberal. Not, not there's three liberals. There's modern liberals, there's the old school liberals, and then there's the liberals of the distant past who are actually libertarians. Exactly. Yeah. The old school liberals, um, the ones from the 60s, they're quite rational compared to anything we see today so and those are the greenwalds and the typies and stuff they're they're joe rogan you name it they're they're liberal in that and yeah. that's the thought but they all seem reasonable i i also i'm i'm i used to be an atheist and then i realized 
I sort of had some epiphany, epiphanies reading, um, who the hell is that guy? Who wrote the bell curve? I can't remember. Um, that was Bloom, not him. Um, but I read a book that really got into my skull, which convinced me that that we really can't take religion out of society because it, it's a it's a glue. Or spirituality, which I would call it. I mean, I'm yeah, not- it's not, you got to have some, you got to have a glue. Yeah. You got to have the yeah. glue. And although I myself am not a sort of a God guy, um, we absolutely need that. And I find myself listening to the guys who spot off about God. And although I'm not a God guy, everything else they say makes sense to me. So I'm, I'm yeah. siding with the God guys. I can listen to some high school kid rant about the Lord and the, the evils of abortion and stuff. But do you believe in a soul? I mean, Dave, I uh, don't want to become too far, but I mean, because I found my way to spirituality through science, actually, because it's sort of the interconnection between, you know, uh, science or reality of truth and spirituality and soul. Uh, is that something you want to talk about? Or uh, I'm can- happy to talk about it. There's almost no, you know, I stay, there's something, here's subjects I stay off of. I don't go near Israel, Palestine. Uh, one day I got dragged there and my brother said, boy, that was dangerous. I said, yeah, I was trying to get away. Um, um, I don't know. It depends on what you mean by spirituality, right? I mean, I'm, I, I don't believe in a higher being. Mm-hmm. Um, I have no trouble with sort of big bang physics theories uh, and stuff like that. But you think about like the essence of creation. I mean, you know, like. Well, I, I think more deeply about what the hell it is we're here for, but I, I don't. But it, it do, doesn't end up in the supernatural sort of flavored part of religion. I just, I, I do think the reason we need religion is because that's what every Sunday morning, you know, the Christians would go to their church and they'd sit around and listen to some guy talk about why you have to behave yourself, you know. And I, it's hard to imagine why that's a bad thing. Um, and, 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 you know, it's easy to focus on religious whack jobs from the past who caused some trouble, which also a lot of those stories are are distorted too, right? So if you look at uh, like the, um, you look at the scientists who were suppressed by the church, they were probably punk ass bitches. They were probably guys who, so, so you're sitting there, you're you're facing down the Catholic church in some previous century. And you discover something. You discover something's the center of the universe or center of the solar system or whatever. You can kind of slide it in gracefully and say the Lord did an amazing thing here. Or you can be a punk. And I think the guys who go gravitate to science probably have a touch of punkishness to them. So my guess is that the guys who got in trouble with the church were the ones who just couldn't avoid picking a fight. You know, and in the old days, like in in ancient Rome, some you know guys would want to martyr themselves. And I've read a lot of ancient history lately, over the last twenty years lately, and um, and they used they'd go to court, they'd want to martyr themselves, and the judge would say, you know, you sure about this? I mean, look outside, the sun's shining. You go out there, have fun. You know, the 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 Roman judges didn't want to just fry these guys. Mm-hmm. And uh, they didn't want to make them sacrifice everything for some religious belief. So they often try to talk them off the ledge. And so, um, so a lot of history screwed up. The Spanish Inquisition is a good one. There's a great, there's a great documentary which I haven't been able to find since I watched it. Um, the Spanish inquisitors were not ruthless by medieval standards. Mm-hmm. They were all legally trained. They, es- they killed an estimated 2,000 people, I think, which is kind of up there with the state of Texas. Mm-hmm. And, and by medieval standards, they were, they were as rational as anybody. And so the question is, where did it come from? Well, it turns out when Spain got in a war, someone passed around pamphlets talking about the evil inquisitors. And they actually know the pamphlets. They know of these pamphlets that got passed around. And then after that... Um, Every time someone went to war with Spain, the Inquisitor story got dredged up. Mm-hmm. And so there's a thing called the Inqu- Inquis- In- Inquisitor Archive. That's only like two million documents in it. Wow. 
And, you know, with the com in the computer age, you can kind of work your way through it and archive it because these, these old archives, like the Medici archives and Inquisitor archives, they, some scholar would go in at 30 and come out at 70 and die and take what he learned with him because it was just so bottomless. And, um, and now with computers and searching algorithms and stuff, you can kind of organize it. And the, the Inquisitor archives, there's this huge amount of information about what the Inquisition was all about. And, um, you know, and it's not to say there weren't bad popes and priests. And you know, of course there were, right? I mean, I think, I think, you know, I think the reason pedophilia is so strong in the church is because some guy who swears off sex or something not up there, right? There's, yeah. there's a loose screw up there. Um, nobody does that. Biology shouldn't let you do that. Um, I'm about to go to war on the... Um, a little bit on the transgender movement. Yeah, totally. I mean, especially well, it's risky for me. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. Lose, I will have no support. Yeah, you know, we have a child. I mean, we have a daughter, a lovely daughter, two and a half years old, and I'm like, I mean, thanks God, I said, you know, I mean, because I lived five years in California, like long time ago, and I said to my wife, Ava, you know, it's like, you know. You know, let's just let's just be happy that we are in Austria still. You know, it's sort of a you know, like on top of a mountain. You know, in a little house. Oh, Biosphere, right? That's yeah. But I'm like, you know, what kind of world? Because you know, we are like totally for homeschooling, and I mean, kindergarten maybe. Yeah, but uh, uh, you know, they're trying, you know, to encroach with all these agendas, and uh, I mean, it's in fucking insane, Dave. You know, I mean, <laughs> what is it from the United Nations? With its, uh, you know, some kind of draft or uh, ID swirling around, like showing what porn to to fucking kids. I mean, are you guys? I mean, the, um, I think this story is going to pass. Okay, but but I just read a. I just read an article this morning or last night that basically said that they were the UK is setting the age of transgender intervention at seven years old. Right, that's just insane. So the two things about first and foremost, I feel bad for people who actually think they're the opposite sex. Life can't be easy for them. It just, it just, it maybe has gotten easier. But they they've got to be tormented souls, and you know teenagers are tormented souls by definition. So you yeah, mix a teenager in transgenderism, you, you you have a, like torment squared. Yeah. And so I I have the deepest sympathy for the people who really are tormented by this, and and at the same time, uh, I I can't sign off on two things. I can't sign off on on totally screwing up women's sports. I coach two collegiate sports, amazingly enough, and uh, and I, I women work their asses off, and just to, to end up getting whomped by some dude, just it just doesn't make sense to me. Riley Gaines is out there fighting power to her. She says that everybody, everybody who talks to her behind closed doors supports her, everybody, but they they won't speak out. And I get it because we watched it happen with the vaccine, right? I had to take the vax or lose my job and I wasn't going to fall on that sword. So I'm guilty. Um, and then, um, and she said, even the head of the NCAA said to her, keep up the good fight. And she said, but you're the guy I'm fighting. You're head of the NCAA. You're the guy I'm fighting. You know, and but he doesn't dare... So um, so we watch women get sports. When I drive past a sporting event where women are out there smacking away, I'm going, this is great. And one of the sports I coached was Taekwondo. I was a minor level coach in that. Um, and it was better for the women than the men. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a more important contribution to their existence than it was for the men. We used to spar men on women. Now, you, you obviously don't clobber them, right? But you you still mix mix sex gender in there, but you don't compete against them, and you don't you don't send guys in to take all the gold medals, mm -hmm. and and then on top of that, you start chemically castrating seven year olds, mutilating, yeah, mutilating, yeah, yeah. and then and that so here's what I think is going to happen. This will pass. 
It, it, when you have 60 or 70 kids in a single middle school who think they're transgender, this is not a health problem. This is, this is, a, this is a, a cultural movement. Yeah. And it will pass just like everything does. But the problem is, is there are going to be a lot of detransitioners. Um, there are people who are activists who, who view the young girls, young boys as trophies. These people should be beaten with a Louisville slugger, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I Merciless. Yeah. I, I have no patience for them. Um, there's no compassion there. It's all about activism for them. They're not worried about the kid. Um, and then um, and then there's going to be this moment in the future where there's going to be kids saying to their parents, where were you when I needed you? Exactly. Yeah. Why did you let me do this? Yeah. Right. I needed a parent at that point in time, not a friend, not a not an activist. Yeah. I and that's called unconditional love when you have a child. I mean, as you know, people who have no children, they, they just they just can't fathom or comprehend. But some of these have children. I, I, I just don't I don't get it. Oh my I, god, that's I mean that's even beyond my imagination. But it okay. is, it is. And, you know, talking about it on this podcast could get me in trouble, but I'll I'm I'll I'll go to the wall on this one. Oh, I know. Uh, I know. <laughs> I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready. If, if Cornell wants to let a shit fit occur, uh, I can handle it. I can just shut up. Actually, if a shit fit occurs and Cornell doesn't do anything, if Cornell decides to make 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 uh, make a case of it, then I'll go to war. Were you the only one who, um, at least, you know, raised concerns about you know the the vaccine, the injury, or, or were there other people who were like okay, there were others? Uh, I, there was a kind of a network of people, but and and I couldn't help them, and they they weren't going to vaccinate, and they got fired. Wow. Now, what I don't know, and I'd love to know, is if there's any tenured faculty members who said hell no, and the the university just turned a blind eye. Mm -hmm. Um. And, and I would like to know that, but I, I don't. I don't right now know how to get that information. Right. Do you think we will ever see justice? I mean, is there will there be like a Nuremberg trial with teeth, like a le real Nuremberg without you know? I mean, because all the you know the real responsible people who finance and everything else, it's it, they got away. I mean, I mean, you know, I'm talking about like a real. <laughs> Here's what could happen. Uh, this Dr. Zoom group, they're always talking about, well, we should take this to the police. And I go, you got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. You think some cop, some sergeant at the desk of a police station is going to? And so, but then they, they, I ended up flipping because what happened is the lawyers got into it and started making progress. And so I, you, know, you ever seen those dominoes where you start with a little one and they get bigger and bigger and bigger and the whole, you know, so it's a progressive domino fall where at the end, the big one falls. I, I think you start out by suing someone relatively minor. So some guy who fired an employee because he, you didn't vaccinate. And, and you sue them, and they, they don't even have the resource to fight it, so that falls. Meanwhile, the lawyers start to learn how to win. Mm -hmm. They get better at it. They collect more information. They get a war chest brewing. Uh, the Dr. Zoom group has lawyers in it, and including some that people know. Um, and, and these guys say, most recent was only about, was about nine months ago. They said something like 16 or 20,000 lawsuits are out there right now. Wow. So these these could start falling like dominoes, and and the, the faster they fall, you know the story the the guy who, who invented intermittent windshield wipers, mm -hmm. and all the car dealer, all the car companies stole them, they just took them, and he spent twenty years fighting, and I would say it might not have been worth it, but wow. he fought for twenty years, and then they started falling like dominoes, and the more they fell, the quicker they wanted to settle, and by the end he, he wow. had them begging for mercy and. We could have a cascading win like that. Um, I would love to see Fauci taken to The Hague, tried for crimes against humanity and executed. But it doesn't stop there, Dave. I mean, we're talking about... Oh, the I know. That would, just be a, that, would be a, that would just be a nice victory. Right. Definitely. Um, Rochelle Walensky. You know, there's a whole bunch... I, I there there's there's layers to the onion. So 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 I understand I've asked medical professionals 
And I get some of them fess up that the whole thing screwed up and others just don't go there. And, and, and I think, do they not know? And then I go, well, what they know is, is that if they start answering questions like that, they're going to get fired. Mm -hmm. So that it's just not worth engaging in that conversation. So, um, and then I dug into Lena Wen. Remember Lena Wen, the CNN expert? Yeah. She's, she's like I a, dug into her. I'm fairly convinced she's a CIA plant. Yeah. And that, that her, although she's at Harvard Medical School, that her entire resume has been fabricated. Uh -huh. um, not that it's not there aren't real papers, is that they're they're really bad papers. And I started reading them and they're just garbage. <laughs> and and they're garbage enough that even though I'm not a biomedical guy, I can see they're garbage. And and I'm pretty sure that a Harvard Medical School professor should be able to wow me with their biomedical intellect. Mm -hmm. And she did not wow me with her biomedical intellect and her papers. They were an elite journal. So I think her sisters, mainland Chinese, highly connected. Yeah. So I, I think Lena Wen, they completely fabricated a career for her and put her at Harvard Medical School. And oh, totally. And she was like, she's been spewing like propaganda. And, and she also was shown being interviewed by Chuck Todd or someone uh -huh. at the Boston Marathon bombing. Oh, how coincidental was that? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. So uh, again, Whitney Webb's book is so overwhelming because it seems like almost every business and every bank and everything in the world is just a front for somebody. Yeah. And I, I'm also working on this basic theory that there's some quantity of money above which by definition, organized crime is involved and organized crime doesn't just mean a Sicilian mafia. It means, it means the Clintons. It means, you know, organized crime in the modern era. Yeah. And the controllers of the monetary, you know, structures. Okay. I, mean, I would love to talk about it, but but maybe next time, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking about like Rothschild. It's just a front front organization, front face, or that you know. But there's some really like a you know bunch of small families that are. I mean, uh, of so course, when someone complex. seems to get caught, when someone when someone seems like so, a question I asked. In a recent podcast, I can't remember which one, maybe Ben's podcast was was what percentage of the FBI is actually working on legitimate things? Yeah, uh -huh. I'd love to know that. And it could be none. It, it really could be none. And it could be that when the FBI sort of gets the bad guy, what they actually got was someone from one of the other families, mm -hmm. the, the mob families, you know, and that 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 that. Um, I, I just have no faith in the FBI at all. And I'm sure there's guys working at the ground level, but you know, the Patriot front looks like feds to me. Yeah. And yeah. to me, it's again, it's treasonous. If feds are trying to stir up a race war, that's just treasonous to me, but the, the Patriot front is farcically bad in my opinion. And so, so in that sense, maybe it's designed to stir up, antagonism to the Patriot front, right? I, I, I just don't know. But when you look at the guys, when they got arrested, and it was a complete sham. The arrest was a complete sham. And then you look at their mug shots. And so these supposed neo-Nazis, not a, you look at their mug shots, not a single one had a, had a tattoo, not a single one. Right, your image of a white supremacist, there'd be a few swastikas, there'd be a few lightning bolts up the neck, you know, um, they also were physically fit. They really looked like, as Joe Rogan said, the 101st Airborne. Um, and so um, so I don't know why they're doing all this. What they did do recently, the, 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 um, the um, Patriot Front showed up and a bunch of MAGA guys started pulling their masks off. Yeah. And I saw that. And that was great, unmasked. So when those Patriot Front boys show up, start pulling their masks off. Get those faces out in the public. Let's identify those bastards. Mm -hmm. If they're real neo Nazis, you know, take go for it. Take them out. I don't care. But um, but um, but if they're feds, I want to know. Yeah. yeah. I I I sleep night way better knowing there's a bunch of neo Nazis out there than a bunch of feds pretending to be neo Nazis. <laughs> like the feds pretending to be. My Twitter feed one at one point got invaded by feds. Mm -hmm. When I 
when I publicly denounced the, remember the Skripal poisoning where the Skripals got poisoned by a nerve agent and I called them liars. And the first time I did, it didn't catch. And the second time all of a sudden it caught, you know, just one of those viral moments or something. Next thing I know, I'm doing multiple George Galloway shows and getting calls from Al Jazeera and Russia Today and stuff like that. Yeah. And I just said, look, the nerve agent that supposedly is uniquely Russian technology um, could be made in a sophomore chem lab. They'd probably die because they don't know how to handle it, but 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 the technology is trivial. I, and then I put it on an exam. I taught a course in organic synthesis and I, I put it on, I put the structure on the exam and the, the question said, look, I got into a bit of an international uh, 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 scuffle um, over this nerve agents that said uniquely Russian technology. I said, here's what you're doing. You got to make it from POCL3, which is a chemical and you got to do it in three steps. How do you do it? And they all got full credit. It's that trivial. I think you could take the four ingredients of the Novichok nerve gas and I think you could mix them together into a punch bowl and end up with enough toxicity to kill a lot of people. Yeah. It's that simple. It is that simple. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, let alone doing it in a, in a way that a chemist would do it. And so that then, and no organic chemists were calling them out. I, I think that I heard one guy who happens to be a friend of mine out there say something, but the, uh, but then eventually the port and down guys who are the nerve experts in Great Britain, who happened to be eight miles away from where the screepals got poisoned, it's kind of Wuhan-y flavored here, and that this is awfully coincidental. Um, and the port and down guys said, no, we can't say it's Russian technology. Because I said that every country in the world has chemists who are qualified to make this nerve agent, period. And, um, and I... I don't know. It strikes me as possible that they were sort of watching me calling them out. And they said, we're not going to stand behind this one because this is we're going to get burned on this. Uh -huh. But I was best I could tell I was the only one calling it, calling bullshit on that story. And I, I have fun doing that stuff. I, I yeah. did, you hear, did you hear about that Chinese so-called Chinese laboratory in California? Um, what is that? I have no idea what to make of it. I have no idea. I looked at the lab. It looked like just a standard lab to me. Okay. It didn't look like some garage. It looked like a laboratory. Um, had, you know, sort of Fisher scientific benches sort of things. It, it looked well equipped. And uh, and for all I know, it's completely fabricated. Completely unadulterated garbage to make us hate the Chinese. To make us, oh, you know, let's go after those oh, evil okay. demons. Mm-hmm. Right. And then there's some like 46 bio bioweapons labs in Ukraine. Yeah. And, and the Pentagon and Victoria Newland admitted it, which shocked me. Uh -huh. and the question is, why have bioweapons labs in, in Ukraine? And the answer is, well, the simpleton answer, not the simple simpleton. You have to be a moron to buy this answer. Is it their leftovers from the Soviet Union? Well, I read Demon in the Freezer about 25 years ago that talked about the challenges that the former Soviet labs posed. We were on it. We were afraid of those labs. And so we got in there fast and said, look, let us help you deal with your friggin' labs. And so we didn't leave Soviet era labs unaccounted for. Yeah. So why would you have a bioweapons lab in Ukraine? And the answer is, well, first of all, it's got to be offshore. Second of all, you need a first a country that's first world enough that you can support a lab, right? You put it in Nigeria, they probably don't have electricity half the time. And so you need the, the first world support. While you also need third world country where, you, because you can't do bioweapons laboratory work on rats, right? If you're gonna say, oh, we gotta be able to kill people, you gotta have people to kill. Yeah. And 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 you know, I found all this organ harvesting. I mean, uh, uh, horrendous. I mean, the organ harvesting uh, facilities in Ukraine and with all the yeah. big. I mean, it's, it's yeah. mind boggling. And we don't seem to call out Zelensky on that one. So that's right. just a puppet. But who's controlling? You think? Who do you think else is uh, besides the oligarch? Is that like a special group? I mean, you know, we've got the free land and the new land. And well, it's. <laughs> It's a bunch of crime families, right? I mean, they're all interconnected. Can you hear me again? 
I can. Whose oh, computer that, did it? Is yeah, that me key words we shouldn't have mentioned, probably. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, there are times where I get the feeling. I was talking to a guy on the phone the other day, and all of a sudden a female voice came on and basically shut off the call. I didn't hear it, but he heard it. Uh huh. Now, it was a protracted conversation, one that was too protracted. We might have just timed out. <laughs> Yeah, I've never been on the phone long enough to time out. This one was, this guy, <laughs> but the guy, the guy is, he says he has great information. He's going to send me on, okay. Uh, okay. On, on, on nefarious things. I'm going, I'm being set up. I'm going to have a network of sources. My door. And by the way, if I ever commit suicide, I didn't do it. No, uh, that's suicidal. I'm not suicidal. No, we're going to, no, no. We're gonna, let me put it this way. If I ever commit suicide, I'm leaving a manifesto. Okay. <laughs> That'd be a good one. I I will write something. That'd really be best seller. Definitely best seller. Yeah. yeah, I will. I will call them out. By the way, if I ever commit suicide, I'm going to take some of the bad guys with me. <laughs> no man, uh, Dave. We need more, you know, investigative jour journalists, researchers, and think tanks like you and Whitney Webb. Uh, yeah, I'm just hoping. But I I I'm secondhand. I just an, am an aggregator. Whitney yeah. does investigative journalism. I, I just thoughts. I'm just That's an aggregator. You know, you connect the dots, you know, I mean, but we shouldn't be putting the same sentence together. I Here's a funny story. And you might have heard it from a previous podcast, but I was listening to the Tim D show and they were talking about Tucker getting fired. Uh -huh. It's a pretty big show, apparently. And and he gets to the end and he says, he says, well, what's that mean for for Fox? They all agree. It just means they're now CNN. So they're garbage. Um and then, and then he said, "Okay, with Tucker gone, what what conservative voices do we need to hear more about?" And he turns to the chick, her name is Savage or something. She says, well, "I'm going to go way outside the box. I'm going with Dave Collum at Cornell." And I go, "Oh, you got to be kidding!" <laughs> so so I, uh, I said it to my family. I said, "Go to the 43 minute mark. You're going to have a you're going to have fun." That's amazing. Oh <laughs> yeah. So I, what it's done is it's caused me to think about the answer to the question, which. But my answer does not include Dave Collum. Um, but I realize that most of the people I think of are lib former liberals. Yeah. And and so the liberals have successfully crossed the midline and 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 gotten pretty reasonable, in my opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not so sure about the conservatives. You know, Dave, you have a substantial I mean, a number of followers and you, I mean, you'd be great like to have like, uh, I don't know, 15, 30 minutes, like uh, regular, on a regular basis on, on, on Twitter or whatever it's called now, X, uh, you know, on a platform where you can. I think I'd wear people down fast. I, I really, People say you should have a podcast. I, I interject. I'm an interjector. Mm -hmm. and, and the podcast host can't be too much of an interjector. So I don't think I'd be a good podcaster. One time I um I set up a podcast with Joe Saluzzi and um ah oh shit, I'm gonna draw a blank, but he's a famous guy. Oh god. In any event, and there was a, a host, and I thought he was gonna run the podcast. He just turned over to me and I wasn't ready. And uh, so we chatted, but it was now I don't think I'd be a good podcast host. And I I think I'm okay in small doses. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's always good, you know, to, you people get like a sort of more of a general overview, a holistic overview or analysis of, on, on a, you know, range of topics, you know. That's, well, that's, one of the reasons I'm going to write about the pedophilia is because I want people to just know of the possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, and, and I write about stuff where when I start writing, I don't know where it's going to go. So I start writing. Mm -hmm. Stephen King, suppose, used to write his novels that way where he, yeah. he said he didn't know the finish. The problem is, when you watch, when you read one of his novels, you go, "Yeah, it shows, dude. Your finish sucked." Um, but but I write about I, I wrote about Roe v. Wade and about some of the legal principles underneath it and stuff like that. And I, I basically wrote about it to see where my writing would take me. Right. And that seems to work pretty well. Just write until you get to the yeah, end of what's the process. You, know, you let it sit. You sleep over it, and then you you know you draft you yeah. redraft it. You know, and then you start seeing the puzzle pieces go together. Right. Um, what I will tell the audience that although I'm a huge fan of Whitney Webb, her books are a tough read. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I, love, the second, you know. I love the second one, by the way. The first one was really exhausting, but the second one was much more thrilling and, you know, sort of more of the bigger picture. Or, or, and I think it's because we know the players in the second volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I was hoping. So I got through the first volume. It was, it was 
painfully detailed about an error in history, which I don't. So they go, so-and-so was CEO of this company. I go, I don't even know that company existed. Uh -huh. And then the second one, all of a sudden you start hearing names of people who are familiar and you go, okay. So, so that's one of the things I found is, is there's, a, there's subjects where like medieval history, mm -hmm. the more you read, the more interesting it gets. Yeah. Because, because and I, when 9-11 occurred, I must have read a half a dozen books on the Middle East. And, and it didn't work because it just, it would take way more than that for me to have this sort of structural framework to understand the Middle East. And, and I sort of came to the conclusion that, that I joined the ranks of the bazillions who do not understand the Middle East. <laughs> and, uh, and, but I tried really hard, but it was just, it, it, it's, it would be like trying to learn Mandarin or something, you know, it yeah. just, it just, it just takes so much work to get a, but, but, medieval history you've got a kind of a working framework that maybe i got from taking you know high school social studies or something i don't know but that's okay mm -hmm. a little bit more a little bit more it's like a, you need a christmas tree to hang the ornaments off right and you, if you have to grow the tree it's going to take a long time yeah so um so in any case, so Whitney's book is, is Rudy Havasey said, is more of a reference book in some yeah, sense. So so, one Nation Under Blackmail, maybe we should just, um, yeah, just mention it. One Nation Under Blackmail. But it's brilliant. It's brilliant. I mean, she, she put a lot of, Jesus, a lot of work. A lot of I, can't, I can't even imagine how much work yeah. she put into yeah. it. I just can't imagine. Yeah, um, by the way, also, she has a daughter who's very, very sick. Yeah. yeah. And so, so some of her her stress that we picked up in the PDB podcast might actually have been sort of personally dri driven, uh -huh. right? Could have been that the life's yeah, been. It's her ex partner now is this Johnny Vetmore. I mean, I don't know what what to think about this guy, but anyway, it's it's, oh, it's oh. Johnny oh. Vetmore. I think that's he, her ex partner now. Uh, she was together oh, with. I didn't know that. Also, yeah. she's got just a mess and a half on her hands. So I wish yeah. you well, Wendy, if you happen to yeah, hear this. Well, I occasionally chat with her digitally, and. Uh, it's such a privilege mm -hmm. to be able to occasionally pose a question or something. Yeah. I have a, I'm locked and loaded on one or two questions about, um, I, I, you know, for example, this this idea of not understanding what you're seeing. We we lost four banks, right? Mm -hmm. So we lost Silicon Valley Bank. We lost a couple others, which are not as memorable. Um, and then no others. That seems very odd. And yeah. you can't say, well, you know, Silicon Valley Bank was on really poor. They go, oh, yeah, they bought too many treasuries. What kind of crazy world is that? You know, they say, oh, well, they should have hedged. You know, I go, hey, I know, but bankers, you couldn't, you wouldn't know how to run a bank in the current monetary climate. It's just, it's just too hard when the interest rates are whipping around like this. So I don't blame Silicon Valley Bank. What I do think is possible is that, um, is that these banks are collapsing CIA fronts or something? Ah, mm -hmm. and so what you do is you um, you collect all this money and then you dump it into all your favorite targets, mm -hmm. and then when it fails, the Fed bails out the depositors, and you start over again. So, so who who lost in the Silicon Valley Bank? And undoubtedly, it's the taxpayers. So everything looks to me like a grift to get taxpayer money into the hands of bad people mm -hmm. and um and ftx collapse last year was precisely that it was ftx was a money laundering operation that had ties through ukraine and, and got away uh sam what do you call it friedman whatever sam bankman fried or biggest donor sam bankrupt us. fraud is another way by the way i bet you he's not even going to do jail time mm -hmm. i think they're, they're starting to drop charges on him left and right yeah. Because they don't think they want that shit going through court. Just like they don't want uh, Hunter Biden shit going through court. Yeah. And so uh, Mr. Bankrupt Fraud, he um, he was laundering money through Ukraine. That money was um, was um, commandeered from government sources and, and then funneled back to the DNC using cryptos and shit like that. And I, it feels to me like right now, the DMs, the Democrats are more corrupt than the Republicans. That could be a that could be a terrible latent bias of mine. But I'm having a terrible time identifying 
Republicans who look as deeply flawed as the Democrats right now. And I, I don't know if someone could no, tell me why I'm missing the point. If do Republicans have different values? I mean, seriously, I mean... Uh, well, it could be. That's a generous interpretation, right? Um, my other theory being that they're all corrupt sort of is inconsistent with that. It could be their role playing. And right now their role is not to be corrupt. I don't know. Mm. Um, what I do know is no one's going to challenge the election that ele reelected them. Mm -hmm. right? So with a with a 26% approval rating on a good day and a 97% reelection rate, who's going to question the elections, right? I think it's very clear that the Republicans didn't want Trump in there either. So they're not going to do anything. Right. Um, in fact, one year I wrote about I wrote about the COVID payouts and I, I, I sort of scavenged up all the cases I could find of family members of politically connected politicians um, who got big payouts for COVID. And the first thing I noticed is they were all Republicans. I go, that doesn't look good for the Republicans, right? That they're all their families are getting the money. And then I noticed they were all in the border states of the 2020 election. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I go, well, maybe it's not connected, but maybe someone got bribed to shut the hell up, right? Look, we'll give your family a ton of money if you just shut up while we take Trump down to the studs. Yeah, I don't know what to think. I mean, sometimes I'm like, uh, what to believe is like Republican, Democrat, you know, all this. I mean, it's a cesspool of, geez, there's so much corruption, criminality. It's beyond our... I mean, we just know a, a fraction of a percentage, you know, what we know. Um, I wanted to just, just I, I want to respect your time, uh, Dave. I mean, I just want to talk about, uh, shortly about CBDCs and, uh, you know, what do you, do you see a sort of a dystopian uh, <laughs> future with CBDCs coming and and also about the BRICS, you know, there's a date, the 22nd of August, there's a big declaration coming. Who knows, you know, what's going to come out of it, but... Uh, do you want to like uh, you know give a bigger picture like what do you see on on the horizon? Well, I think the CBDCs are unstoppable. That's my guess, right? And and I think they have the potential of doing horrific damage. Yeah. Because of the idea that that'll give central banks unlimited power to destroy their currencies. But also it gives authoritarian, totalitarian control over the populace. Now, what I don't know is if that's necessarily what will happen, but the potential will be there. So what people don't understand is that CBDCs are programmable. Most people who listen to this probably do understand this because they're obviously on social media and things like that. But um, the CBDCs can be programmed to the point where when you get your paycheck, some quantity of it is usable for food, some quantity of it usable for beer, some quantity usable for housing. And they can they can cut off or reallocate however the hell they want. If the government decides, for example, to stimulate the housing market, they'll allocate more for housing. You know, right? That sort of thing. That's a very authoritarian state. That's a that the best model to, to that that's akin to the old mining towns where they paid you in in corporate chips that could only be used in the store in the town where the mine was, and so you had no escape routes. You couldn't save because you couldn't build up cash, and um, and uh, and so CBDCs could become totalitarianism real fast. I just don't know if they're going to, or if that's just the worst case scenario. Right. And if you could connect it with all the dystopian, technocratic, you know, super surveillance monitoring, you know, I mean, this is like pure technocratic dystopian slavery. I mean, if. And if the problem is, we tend to think that somehow in the modern age, we've gotten smart enough to avoid this crap. Yeah. Let's say we, because I sure don't at this point. But, but if you look through history, you know, We've slaughtered human beings at every turn. And, and so there is no reason. The world, when people say, how could someone fly planes into the Twin Towers? How could they do that? And I go, well, you know, the same guys who made that call, are the, maybe the ones who would have had to have dropped, you know, 20,000 soldiers to their death on Omaha Beach. Hmm. If you say, look, we're going to lose three to 5,000 people, but it'll get us into the Middle East where we got to get to. You go, well, that's the price of it. That's the price we pay. And um, and uh, 
and so so it's just not 911 is at least easy to explain yeah it's it's hard to fathom for some people but usually those are the people who have not actually paid attention so if someone's listening is going what are you talking about i urge you to go to youtube or rumble and find the documentary the new pearl harbor it's about three and a half hours long i think it's got everything there. If you can watch the new Pearl Harbor and come out of it thinking that you understand nine, that thinking 9-11 was just Arabs. Uh, yeah, yeah. Jesus. You're either a better or worse person than me. I don't know which. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, on the other hand, you know, you can't start off talking about energy directed weapons because it's just too much to handle for people. But uh, this is what I'm convinced of because, you know, you see the towers pulverizing. It's pulverizing. I mean, right. Actually, for me, you know, so Building 7 is the go-to, no way that fell correctly, right? And I have no trouble with that. I think an even better case is the fact that the Pentagon was hit by a plane that there's not a single shred of footage showing it flying in, even though we had 45 minutes notice that it was coming. There's not, there's no footage. And then people say, well, where's the plane then, Mr. Smarty Pants? I don't know, the fucking Atlantic Ocean? You know, I don't know. I, I don't need, I don't need to come up with the correct theory to know that the, the what's being told is bullshit. That's the key. It takes a lot of work to actually figure out what did happen. Uh -huh. It is way easier to figure out that what they're telling us didn't happen. Right. And so, so, so once, once you wrap your brain around 9-11, and I, I didn't even know about it until probably 2007. And then a physicist friend of mine sent me footage of Building 7 falling. I go, holy shit, that's not right. I I don't know how you can watch Building 7 collapse and think it's normal. <laughs> so once you accept 9-11, then all of a sudden your Overton window got thrown wide open. Uh, uh. And it, you still have to pry it further if you go down the, you know, the spirit cooking satanic cult rabbit hole. Uh. But here's what I'll tell you is there's prominent people who openly have dinner parties in which they pretend to eat cadavers and babies and things like that. And their art is twisted. Their art's so bad. The Tony Podesta art collection is so bad that if you Google it, and they've scrubbed a lot of it from Google, so you got to go down a ways, but you see just twisted stuff. Yeah. And, um, and, and you go, um, I, I'm not sure I should have this Google page up on my computer. It's that twisted. Yeah. Yeah, you're, it's it's it's. You wonder if you're not going to have the feds burst through the door and say yeah, you got yeah. perverted art on yeah. your computer, right? It's so it's really fucked up. I mean, I don't even really want to look up. at that. I don't even want to look. I mean, at it's, it. it's it's uh, it's it's satanic creatures yeah. with babies strapped on their backs in cages. I, yeah. I just yeah, it's ch children in their underwear chained together. I, I just it's it. And this is Tony Podesta. That this is you know John Podesta's brother, a lobbyist. Hillary Clinton's, you know, buddy, you know, this, yeah. this, this is real. Spirit cooking, the, this idea of eating bodies. Now, it is undeniably true that people pretend to do it. What we don't know is if they actually do it. Yeah, or this whole adro adrenochrome, which, which actually they mentioned it. Adrenochrome. In interviews, uh, John, uh, Jim Caviso in his interviews. I mean, it's a it's an open secret now. They do it. They they you know. Well, for whatever so, reason. so the adrenochrome is what they use to hammer Caviezel mm -hmm. with to say, "Oh, he's so Nazi believes in adrenochrome." Oh, uh -huh. um, for those who don't know, the claim is that the satanic bastards um, actually kill children, torture children, uh, torture first. them under excruciating yeah. and, and suffering and, and excruciating death. The idea being that I think it's your adrenal gland, gland kicks out vast quantities of shit that you then drink the blood and it, it rejuvenating, right? You go, this, is, that, is that what they expect? Is that really what they I, I don't know. Is, is, I don't even know if they do it. I don't know if it's some internet. But what is true is they pretend to do it. They look fucking Unambiguously, they pretend to do it. Yeah, because you know, um, withdrawal symptoms. I don't know. <laughs> they they don't look uh, they don't look good. These people. I don't know. They no, so let me let me just do a quick experiment to see what people will find here. But I, I, I if you search, mm -hmm. um, spirit cooking on Google. Of course, everyone's Google is different. But let's search spirit cooking. Um. Uh, 
Um, I'm not hitting the really, really gruesome shit, although I think if you clicked on the links, you'd find it. Um, but there's this Marina... Marina Abramovich. Ab Abramovich. Also, yeah, friends sort of with the Rothschilds. Abramovich, yeah. Is she a Rothschild? No, no, but she's friends. You know, I always see her on some pictures with the Rothschild, with this old, you know, uh, white, pale Rothschild, you know, uh, with, with these really sickening art, so-called art pictures and... Yeah, you know, and but also there's uh, there's yeah. pictures of the Hollywood elite standing around this cadaver like they're yeah. about to eat it, right? Mm -hmm. Hollywood elite. These are famous actors. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going, if I were Hollywood elite, you would not catch me dead near that 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 get together because yeah. just the concept of it is so twisted. And I remember I used to read about people who ate the placenta of their child. Yeah. And I remember thinking, you know, frying up a placenta is pretty sick. Uh, but, but, okay, spirit cooking, uh, a Google search on spirit cooking came up not totally gruesome, although you would, no trouble you would find the articles with the gruesome shit in it. <laughs> but it's real. They do pretend to eat bodies, and therefore they are twisted bastards by any metric, right? I, yeah, I'm but these, sure these so-called Hollywood celebrities, do you think they are they're groomed into it or MK controlled or I mean well or... one of the claims is by several Hollywood elites is that their career wasn't moving until they signed off on it. Yeah. Uh... Until they actually have to sort of join the church of holy shit. And 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 it is that's part of the compromising process. And then I and then there's things like um, Corey Feldman running around telling the world that 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 there's pedophilia all over Hollywood. Now it turns out his buddy Corey Heim supposedly got raped repeatedly and killed himself. And Elijah Wood said, concurred that there was um, that there was pedophilia, and then he recanted. But if you read anything about these sort of things, the recanting is usually at gunpoint. Um, and so Corey Feldman is not naming names yet because he's made a documentary. And he says, look, I I need people to see the documentary. And if I name the names, then they won't go. Mm -hmm. And so he was on The View one day and he mentioned the pedophilia. And this was so stunning to me. He mentioned the pedophilia um, in Hollywood. And it was when Barbara Walters was on The View. Yeah. And Barbara Walters, what would be logical? Well, you'd you'd say, oh, boy, that's really awful. Let's go to commercial. And then you say to Corey, would you please shut up, right? Don't go there. We don't, this is not, this is a family show, right? Don't go there. And, um, but that's not what she did. She attacked them. And I watched it going, why is she attacking them? Well, it turns out that I'm reading one of my books and, and it turns out that Barbara Walters was tight as, and they used to joke about them being married tight with Roy Cohn, who was one of the biggest sexual blackmailers of the 20th century. He was, he made Jeffrey, he trained Jeffrey Epstein. He made Jeffrey Epstein look like a piker. What about uh, talk, uh, uh, Donald Trump? Was it was Roy Cohn a sort of a, a... I'm having trouble figuring out Trump's relationships with these guys. So he has passed, he has, he's crossed paths with them. I, I haven't found smoking guns that make Trump. So the claim is, Trump was uh, that that Roy Cohn was Trump's mentor. Yeah, I think did we read that in One Nation on the Blackmail? Was that in? Was... Well, I'm still working my way through Volume <laughs> Two, so I might be short of that part, so I yeah. don't know. But but what I do know is is that getting photographed with badasses doesn't make you a badass. Yeah, yeah. Because all these guys are running in the powerful circles and parties. Yeah. You can't be rich and powerful without occasionally running across badass rich and powerful types. And so mm -hmm. so I won't convict a person due to a association unless the association is like 28 flights on the Lolita Express, yeah. like Clinton, right? Right. I have no doubt the Clintons have whacked political opponents. Oh, the man. death toll question seems unambiguous to me. The Vince Foster case, by the way, Whitney just went through that case. And it, it's uh, it's compelling. I mean, Vince got whacked. And, yeah. Uh, and he just knew too much. And, you know, Michael Hastings and Seth Rich and the, you know, these guys are getting whacked left and right. 
Kevin Spacey got accused by oh, four God. people. He got acquitted huh? in UK. Was that UK? The, the trial in UK. I mean, <laughs> and, and all these witnesses, they just, uh, yes, got suicided or I don't know, or dead. Or yeah, so three out of the four people who accused Kevin Spacey of bad behavior ended up dead. And the fourth said, you know, I'm good. I'm out. Don't worry about me. I'm done. Which you would do, right? And so he goes on the list of badasses. Um, there's a picture of um, there's a picture of Ghislaine Maxwell and Kevin Spacey sitting in a cabin. Yeah, from the, of the Queen, right? Of the Queen, yeah, yeah, the Queen's cabin, sitting on the throne. You know, yeah. this, is, this this of course could just be their ties to Prince Andrew, who seems unambiguously a perv. Yeah. Um, and why he's still in the royal family when when Prince Harry is not, I don't know. I don't understand. But um, so um, I, I just don't know how deep it goes. This is the thing. I mean, these could be anecdotes. Yeah, this is what, I'm, what I was saying in the beginning. And I was like, OK, I finally got the truth. <laughs> we, we have the truth. But, you know, it goes deeper and deeper. It goes even, you know, beyond even my imagination of, you know, of. Uh, oh, evil. Well, so I read a, I, there's a documentary on the Franklin scandal, which is a lousy documentary. It's a very low grade documentary. And therefore, you, if you watch it, you go, oh, you know, who knows yeah. what this crap is, right? The Clinton Chronicles, by the way, were equally low grade, but they told a compelling story of Clinton uh -huh. in Arkansas. But in any event, there's a book, The Franklin Scandal, and I found it to be compelling. I thought the author did a great job. And it's a pedophile ring in Omaha, Nebraska, that that doesn't seem that broadly based, although there's stories of of ritual sacrifice and crap like that and flying kids around the country to be to be um, to be rented out. But um, but it seems relatively small in scale. But what's staggering about the Franklin scandal is the incredible incredible intervention of the feds to shut it down yeah so so the the chief of police turned out to be the first wall of defense but he was one of the pervs so that didn't yeah. work the yeah. attorney general of the state of nebraska shut it down the fbi came in and completely annihilated all the yeah. witnesses yeah. this is what i was saying dave in the beginning you know it's like prosecutors judges lawyers Politics, right. legislation. Right. I mean, everybody in, in those circles is involved in some way or another, or somehow. Well, or or they're just so aware of how deep the the corruption oh, is, they just go, "I'm not I touching see. it." Right. Yeah, so, so I, it's like it's like uh, it's like herd immunity, right? Okay. You don't have to yeah. vaccinate yeah. everyone. You just have to vaccinate. You have to get the vaccination up to a height of density that that it doesn't oh. propagate. And so, mm -hmm. so if you own. If you own people in very high places and scattered throughout the system, you can always find a way to tell someone don't go there, right? Yeah. And I read Poisoner in Chief, which is about the MK Ultra program, which until I would say a year and a half ago, I thought was true, but probably highly glamorized and probably overstated. And then I found out that, no, it was actually quite a large scandal in the early 70s. I just didn't know about it. It was sort yeah. of above the fold stories about the bad shit they did, real Dr. Mengele crap. Yeah. And, um, and, and it came out because I read the book Chaos, which three people told me to read. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I wouldn't have. It's about Charles Manson. And it turns out the book connects him to the CIA and all the oh, yeah. and Bianca murders were CIA driven. And they connect him to a guy named Jolly West, who turns out to be MK Ultra Boston Division uh, Kingpin. Mm -hmm. And he connects up with Manson and all the things that didn't make sense to the author of that make sense. But then he then he starts making other connections with Jolly West. And it turns out Jolly West had ties with the Oklahoma City bombing. Jo Jolly West had ties with, uh, and, and, and the author said, this is a lead that I did not want to find and I did not want to go down, but I found it and I had to go down. And it turns out Jolly West inserted himself into the Jack Ruby trial. I see. Uh huh. Makes sense. Uh, and you're going, holy Jesus oh, Christ, this oh, Jolly West guy's a badass. Yeah. And, um, and so I think MK Ultra, uh, Ted Kaczynski was MK Ultra. I thought Ted Kaczynski was MK Ultra going bad. Mm -hmm. I now think that Ted Kaczynski was MK Ultra playing out. Oh, mm -hmm. right. So if you're doing mind control shit, 
Ted Kaczynski is an experiment. Yeah. And and I think the shootings in the schools, some percentage of them are are MK Ultra like things. I don't know what percentage could be 80. I don't think it's 10. I think a lot of these shootings are are drug addled teens yeah. who have been who've been uh, coerced in various ways to, yeah. to do bad things. And mm-hmm. There's common there's common denominators to to all the shootings that don't make sense, like all their hard drives end up missing and things like that. Um, so, um, so I think this and the CIA is founded on the CIA and intelligence are founded on organized crime. Mm-hmm. So, so we know that organized crime played a role in things like World War II. The Sicilian mob helped soften the target for uh, invading Sicily or whatever, and. But it turns out that organized crime was tied to the U.S. government before the CIA was founded. They founded the CIA using organized crime as the pillar. So the CIA was was criminal enterprises from day one. Yeah. And then you got the Operation Paperclip, Nazi, whatever, scientists and That's whatever. Right. They, and, and, and people into the OSS. It wasn't the pre- precursor of the CIA uh, Yes, and and one so everyone knows about the 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 the, the German scientists we brought over, which makes total sense. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, well, let's go get the scientists. Well, it turns out we brought all the Dr. Mengele type doctors too, and we put them in Fort Detrick and put them on payroll and had them teach us everything they knew about torturing people and what they had learned from their days in in the German concentration camps and. Right. Uh, and whether or not we got Mengele himself seems to be up for discussion. I thought it was put to rest that he didn't make it because he was too visibly important. They had to off him. But then I recently ran into a case where they think he came in under a pseudonym. Uh-huh. And, uh, uh-huh. and, and so, uh, so in any event, we brought the worst of the worst out of Germany. Right. Put, put him on payroll here. So. Um, so on a I positive think the note, CIA is, I think the CIA is completely yeah. rogue, though. I don't think there's. I don't think the head. I had dinner with the head of the CIA once. Really, he's a douchebag of a higher order, uh, unimaginable, actually. But he, um, it was fun to have dinner with him. Um, and I don't think the head of the CIA has any idea what the CIA is doing. Because he's so compartmentalized, right? Yeah, sleeper cells, right? Because you can't afford to have a, an intelligence agency where the whole thing unravels because somebody gets caught by the Soviets, right? I'm not convinced the Soviets and MI5, MI6, Mossad, I'm not convinced they even are independent of each other. I know they work together and talk and things like that, but but I'm not even convinced they're not just part of one organization, right? You know what? I had a bunch of other questions, but I don't want to take up your time. Uh, I was t- <laughs> asking about this whole alien because, because I mean, you know, I've been researching a lot about, you know, compartmentalized military industrial technologies and, uh, you know, forget the aliens, forget the, everything else. You know, I think it's a huge, a lot of distraction, but yeah. I think I want to jack up somehow the space force and, and, or maybe as a last joker, false flag alien invasion <laughs> i don't know maybe the system is so fucked up dave that they ha- they have no other you know uh ammunition you know so <laughs> so to wrap it up with what do you think about this whole you know i don't know this whole theater with um well the alien story is in my opinion one of two things one is just a big distraction yeah so thank well, you. Well, we're talking about aliens. We're not talking about laptops, things like that. We're not talking about pedophiles. No, it's about the technology, um, actually. But anyway, yeah. I don't think uh, uh, aliens who have the technology to get here across the vast expanses of space, which really essentially defies the laws of physics as we know it. As we know it, yeah. Right. So we have no inkling of technology that could get us to cross that vast expanse of space. Not officially. If they, do it, they are so advanced, they couldn't give less of a shit about us. Mm-hmm. We're just ants. They, we are at best those the planet that was discovered that has life on it, right? If, if they're, And I don't think they're here. I don't think they covered the vast expanse. I think they're out there. I, yeah. I have no doubt they're out there. But I don't think they get here. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and they sure as hell aren't going to anthropomorphically flying spaceships and shit that look just like ours. Mm-hmm. Right? 
and and oh yeah, that thing. Look how fast that thing's moving. And no, it's it's going to be an otherworldly technology that we would be like an ant crossing a highway and not recognizing that he's actually crossing a highway. And um, uh, I think that's what it be. So so I, I I it would take a lot to convince. Put it this way, I would sign off on the fake moon landing a lot faster than aliens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot faster than aliens. And that's not a way up on my list of, but I don't rule it out, but it's not way up on my list. Yeah. But do you think that since the 40s, 50s, a lot of, you know, trillions and trillions have been, you know, pouring into the compartmentalized, highly secretive, you know, military industrial de- development of whatever, uh, you know, technologies of which we cannot even fathom and which, you know. Yes. Right. Yes. I, th- I okay. think. I remember probably 30 years ago, some guy was who was in the Air Force was telling me what the planes could do. And it was kind of shocking to me. Uh-huh. And, and, and in retrospect, I said, well, of course they can do that. But um, but, you know, if the pilot blacks out, the plane flies home, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and but that was way back when that kind of technology wasn't above the fold. Exactly. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. And yeah. Um, so yeah, I I got to figure if we could see everything they knew, uh, we'd be staggered by the technology that's available. I think I, I don't think there's a shred of Silicon Valley that isn't under control of one or more te- uh, intelligence agencies, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and even if even if they many of them started with funding from the intelligence agencies. So um, mm-hmm. I think uh, one of the reasons I'm not a crypto guy is because I think that's all part of the game and, and bitcoin I, I mean crypto is shit but uh cri- did you have you have you changed I, i'm not a, i'm not a bitcoin guy I, okay. I could be converted to one i've talked about this many times but the reason yeah. i'm not is one of the many um is that that if, if 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 bitcoin is is a deep state construct mm-hmm. then then i will be the last sucker in the pool before they throw the toaster oven in Mm-hmm. So I, I, a simple model is, is that Bitcoin was supposedly the first white paper on Bitcoin, the first one that made reference to a cryptocurrency, made reference to coins and things like that was a was an NSA paper authored by three guys, mm-hmm. supposedly. Yeah. And uh, and and so I could imagine you say, well, look, let's throw it out there. Let's let let's crowdsource the kinks out of the system. Let's let let's let the crazies who who do this sort of thing for fun sort of develop it, and then when it comes time, we'll just step on it and and take what they learned oh. and use it to our advantage. So I we 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 could be crowdsourced sourcing Bitcoin for um, the authorities. Oh, okay. And and In case the whole means we will crashed. become. It's like the FBI informants at January six who think they're part of the plot and they don't realize they're about to be written out of it. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Right, because if you're an FBI informant, and you're January six, and you think, oh, what they can't, they won't arrest me because I'm working with them. Well, they're happily put you in jail. They don't care about you. And so you got to make sure you're not the sucker sitting at the table, not understanding mm-hmm. that you're the sucker sitting at the table. Yeah. But there are some could bitcoins. Be that. That's one yeah. of my concerns. So, uh huh. Because there are some bitcoins. I mean, who do say, you know, yeah, sure, it could have come out of the whatever Intel, NSA, whatever, you know, <laughs> scene. But but then it got out of hand, and then you know it got sort of totally decentralized, and 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 you know for the good. Well, part. Rudy, Rudy, in our podcast said what I've said many many times. How will Bitcoin do if the authorities say uh, after January 6th and watching Julian Assange and watching the things that the authorities will do, they say that's unconstitutional. I go, we don't care. We don't care Mm -hmm. because we're an authoritarian state, right? right? We pretend to be a democracy, but we're an authoritarian state. So so what will happen if people have Bitcoin and the authorities say you're going to do 10 years in jail if you use it? Well, then the whole, I mean, then we have totally other worries and concerns. I mean, then, then. You right. Know. But but it also, if if you've got, at yeah. that point, the question is, will you say, I'm glad I have Bitcoin or do I wish I had gold? Yeah, I say, yeah. That makes a little sense what you're saying. Yeah. yeah or this- do I wish I just had a house that had sort of concrete yeah. value or something like that. And, and so I agree that we've got huge problems if they do that, except for the fact that 
you know, they did it with the vaccine. Right, right. And they could say it was it's the only currency that, you know, that it's lawful. I mean, that's legal, uh, you know. For uh, now. For right, now. Right. And you start hearing about drug runners using it, then it's time to duck. Right. Um, and and so I'm just watching it, entertained by it. Um, and But I, I have no doubt that they will step on us like ants. When the time comes, right? You wouldn't have believed that they would do to the January 6th guys that they did. Yeah. You wouldn't have believed that they would be able to shut down the discussion of the vaccine the way they did. Right. People would be fired from their jobs in medical schools for saying the vaccine doesn't seem like a good idea. Hmm. Right. I, you never would have, I never would have believed that. I would have said, oh, no. the system has checks and balances. Right. But it doesn't. The checks and balances are long since gone, and there's I mean, I mean, there is there's, there is no checklist. There is no constitution. There is they're no only there when they don't care, right? So, right, you know. But the, the, if 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 the highest powers decide something is not going to happen, you know, it's not going to happen, right? But but final question, Dave. I mean, if if. I mean, just on a positive note, if if Donald, let's just say, you know, Donald Trump is one of the good ones, and he really wants to, you know, uh, transform the, you know, tra the country and, you know, save the constitution and whatever, and and just just bring sanity back. I mean, do you think he would, you know, he would just clean up with a military tribunal or, or I don't know. So here's my Donald Trump analysis. That is, Donald Trump started his presidential run with what I would call a a very shallow, broad narcissism. He, uh -huh. he just, just more microphone, right? And just more fun, more Trump everywhere, more ego massaging. I think over the presidency, Donald Trump's narcissism never went away, but his narcissism caused him to conclude that he wanted to be one of the greats. Ah, okay. You can't be one of the greats just by being a blowhard. Right. And so but with an, with an ethical I think he figured okay. out that if he, if he can transform the United States right. into something in his image, then he's one of the greats. So I think his narcissism has driven him to figure out what it takes to be one of the greats. That's that's my generous interpretation of Donald Trump. Makes a little sense. Yeah. But but then if that's true, then they will do everything they can to stop him. Stop him. Did you hear the story um that by indicting him? On his um, on his intent to commit election fraud or something, that they open the door to him being able to now defend himself. Yeah, by bringing yeah, the and subpoena everybody and fraud. and like like the whole thing is just uh, helping him actually, isn't it? I mean, well, and then the question is, were they really that stupid, or did someone hold that door open? Huh, that's a good question. Hmm. What do you think? Uh, huh. I I just don't have an opinion yet. I I just I, I do know the indictments look stupid, uh, incredibly stupid, incredibly stupid. I mean, it's all in the open now. It's it's like so obvious now. It's and and it it's helped him. It's really kind of entertaining to watch, and he can get elected in prison and then pardon himself. You know, I mean, right? He, he, they won't get him. You know, it takes so long to put someone in prison. Look how long it took Elizabeth Holmes to be put in prison, who's yeah. also, by the way, a CIA operative. Yeah. Um, it took years to put her in prison. So if Trump wants to stay out of prison until the election, he can do it. And then as soon as he's he's elected, he can pardon himself, I think. You think they're going to provoke a civil war? I mean, you know. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not thrilled by a world in which Donald Trump has to be brought back. I, I really would rather... I'd rather see Kennedy get elected. Really? Okay. Yeah. On a lot of I, points. I yeah. He, I don't think he can survive it. I, I really don't think they'll let him be president at any cost. Yeah. yeah. And so um, it would be great. But I, at this point, I don't know. Well, if well, they want to make a marcher out of him, hmm, I don't know if that's, that's, if that's a good idea. Yeah. Senator Johnson, I trust. There's a couple. Yeah. I think Johnson's a good guy. Um mm -hmm. I don't know too many. I Rand Paul has grown on me. 
Um, I didn't like him at first because I thought he didn't, I thought he was a poser. I thought he was trying to imitate his dad, but didn't know how to do it. And, but he, the battle scars have strengthened him. Uh -huh. So I, I, I could become a Rand Paul advocate very quickly. I still would like to see Tulsi Gabbard on someone's ticket, even though they're, there are little hints of things to worry about, but you know, there's there's little hints of things to worry about all the candidates. So yeah. if you're looking for the perfect candidate, you're gonna be waiting a long time. And I, I don't have an opposition to DeSantis. I just I don't know what to make of him. I'm still I don't, know. I don't trust DeSantis anymore. I don't know. He's there's something about him. There's something that's not getting him. He's like, you know, like this and that, you know, he's going in every direction. And then well, I also think he's flailing because he's it's not working. Yeah. So if he's flailing, like, you know, debating Newsom, that's the consolation round. Those two guys are going to take third and fourth place. They're debating who's going to take third. Uh -huh. right? Neither is going to get the nomination unless unless something happens to Biden, which I think, by the way, might. Um, I guess if I had to bet if it was not Biden, I would bet that um, Big Mike Obama would potentially um, be the nominee. What a nightmare. Oh, my God. Fool you once, fool me once, fool me twice. Huh? What is it called? Well, uh, the reason she'd get a lot of votes, A, chick, B, black, C, you get Barack for free. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people would like to see Barack come back. So all of a sudden, you'd get the behind the scenes. It's like having Dick Cheney as your vice president, right? Right, um, right. And, uh, and so, and I've heard from someone who knows someone who claims to know she has no interest in pol in campaigning. Uh -huh. And so one of the things they could be doing is stalling long enough to, to, to allow her to come in at the 12th hour. Uh huh. Okay. If she has to come in now, she's got to campaign her ass off. Yeah. So, and I'm pretty sure that nobody wants Kamala. No, she's so fucking stupid. She's so stupid. Yeah, I know. I make a career. In fact, one of my friends who's met her said, "There's, there's, there's stupid, and then there's Kamala." <laughs> it's it just all oh, species, but oh my god! But, you know, she's not as stupid as Fetterman. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I, the Democrats seem to be uniquely capable of picking horrific candidates for various positions. So some of us thought, you know, they, they like to bitch about Trump's administration, but you look at, a, uh, at, at Biden's and the, the level of incompetence is just staggering. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, so like Tony Blinken is repugnant. Merrick Garland was a candidate for the Supreme Court. Look at him now. He, he has no respect for the Constitution. Yeah. No, so there's no, there's no worldliness about him. He's just a, a whore. Yeah. And and then you get the guy with stealing the luggage and the transgender secretary of health, and you you just just unbelievably the 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 woman who's Department of Energy has Secretary of Energy who didn't know how many barrels of oil the U.S. Yeah. Used. Yeah. I mean, it's just beyond in incompetence. I don't know. This is it must be intentional. I mean. To put people or the press speaker, who is this clown? You know, this clown lady who can't even, you know, I mean, she's just a puppet. I don't know. She's just oh, kidding. the new he that head of the CDC, yeah, yeah that's she oh, her. No, I mean, the White House, you know, the what do you call it? African Afro American? Oh, you mean the, the, the press sector? Press yeah, yeah, I mean, she's so... I, I'm, more, I'm more forgiving to her, actually, because I think she's playing the worst hand you could possibly play. I, I think she's being asked questions that there's no answer to. Well, she can, but she 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 does, she can. She's not allowed to, I mean, you know, to... Well, that's my point, though. So, yeah. you know, I wasn't a big fan of Pisaki either, but I thought she's playing the hand as well as she could. Yeah. I mean, having to defend Biden administration's actions... Yeah. Is a losing job. Mm -hmm. Like the one, the one that the press secretary was off the charts was Kaylee McEnany. Mm -hmm. She could intellectually destroy the questioner. Right, and, right. And what's her face? Uh, Huckabee Sanders was not bad. Yeah. And they had tough hands to play too, right? Being Donald Trump's press secretary couldn't be an easy job, right? Uh, no. You're constantly having to explain shit that you really. Going, oh my God, come on, Don. 
Oh, man. Dave, uh, we're going to wrap this up. Thank you so much. I mean, it's always a pleasure and so educational. I learned so much from you. Um, Dave, any other final words of wisdom or uh, want to send my <laughs> my followers and listeners? Well, let me give you a quick economic pitch that's that, that, huh? I, that, that, that I, I give in almost every podcast, but nevertheless. Um, here's my elevator speech for why we're in trouble for generationally in trouble. But there's the obvious, you know, debt growing at seven and a half percent a year, right? You can't win that. Um, so I think we're past the fail safe point and all that crap. The the de-dollarization world, that's a problem. But but back in 1981, um, the market PE was about six. I hate PE because you can fake them like crazy, but let's use it. It was about six. So it was dirt cheap. Inflation was raging, but about to de-inflate. The Russians were desperate for capital and they sold, they started selling resources for pennies on the dollar. The Chinese were coming out of the dark ages so badly that when they had to send one their leader to the United Nations, they had to scrape, they had to mooch money to pay for the trip. They had supposedly $38,000 in their entire banking system of US dollars. And, um, and so China started selling labor for pennies on the dollar. And 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 so those were tailwinds that will never be repeated. So interest rates were at twenty percent, about to drop to zero over forty next forty years. Again, huge tailwinds. Because of those tailwinds, the market valuations, which is the most mean regressing metric in all of Wall Street, is market valuation. It should just flop around. And when the market's cheap, the valuations are low. And when the market's expensive, the valuations are high. And you can argue all you want about why they go high and why they go low. But the fact is they're mean regressing. It is a met, it is a price divided by something that ought to track that price. So we're not talking about the cost of the market or the, the, the measured value. We're talking about the valuation. The valuations compounded over those 40 years at over 3% a year. There's no chance we repeat that either because they're now at record valuations. And, and therefore, what if the next 40 years, we don't have fresh labor coming in from China the way we did. We don't have fresh resources coming in from Russia the way we did. We are now at rock bottom interest rates. Which everyone says, oh, low rates are bullish. No, dropping rates are bullish. Low rates are a goddamn disaster. Because once the rates are down there, you don't get the tailwind of dropping rates anymore. And so none of those tailwinds are going to be there for the next 40 years. And so what happens if the market valuations back up and that we compound a negative 3% a year for the next 40 years? That's a, that's a negative six, that's a negative 6% swing per year on change in val on valuations wow. for okay. 40 friggin' years. Now, I don't know how it's going to play out. But my brain tells me that that can't be won. And therefore, I believe that we're going to Nikkei our way into the next generation. Hmm. And you, you, the Nikkei was an uninvestable market for a very long time, decades. And it might become uninvestable again. And, um, and, but it's not as bad as the U.S. market. And so the question, and the world markets too, it turns out. The world markets are obviously heterogeneous, but they have their own problems, their own debt problems, their own everything. So I think we are about to enter a period in history where for several decades, the markets will be uninvestable. You will, there will be winners, but they will be just outliers. Mm -hmm. they, they will be people who, you know, fooled by randomness. They'll be the guy who flipped the coin five times and got five heads. And you'll think the guy's a genius, but he just was one of the lucky guys. And so I, I think that at some point we're going to start a generational bear market that is going to grind investors to dust. And I think in part it's because the boomers are going to start liquidating their assets. And you got this demographic problem. You got a, a population yeah. collapse going on in the world. Yeah. And so everything that, that during that 40 year period, the boomers showed up in the workplace. They brought their wives with them. We mm. were young. We were eager. We were we were we had shaken the pot habits and started making computers and stuff like that. And, and now I think those days are over and I don't know when, uh, but, you know, they might start this year, might start five years from now. But at some point, I think we're going to go into a generational bear market.
it needs it would need huge structural changes or i don't know a huge transformation i mean huge action uh, i don't know what it, what right it, and then the question becomes is when that's over do we then grow green shoots and come out the other side or do we do a roman empire thing now i th i think we have in the united states um great resources right we got a yeah. pretty large acreage per capita we got we've got we've got natural resources things like that so I, I think optimism that, that it'll be a cyclical downdraft, I think there's reason for that optimism, but I don't think it's going to happen on a time scale that is imaginable uh -huh. to most investors. Yeah. I am the most bearish guy on Twitter. Far none. Far none. I may be Hussman, but not even Hussman because Hussman now sort of tries to play the current game. And I just, I stand firm on the idea that we're screwed. Mm -hmm. But what do you invest in, may, if I may ask? Or what, what's, what's your suggestion to people? Like, Well, I keep fishing around. I keep trying to trick the markets into duping me <laughs> without putting enough money to actually be duped. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to generate a karmic moment without spending a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So uh, my most recent purchase, I bought Brazilian ETF. Okay. And Brazilian stocks are cheap. You got political risk, of course. Yeah. Um, the Petrobras is dirt cheap. Um, I think energies, resources, yeah. I think the story, although it's a very popular story, it takes so many years to build up the infrastructure to, to, to create the next glut. Mm -hmm. So I'm investing, by the way, in uranium, small caps through a, through a, through a two man, two man fund, uh, Gehring and Rosenzweig. Um, I have high hopes for nuclear. And I'm relatively unexposed to the equity markets I, i'm i'm i don't know 20 percent equities okay mm -hmm. and a lot of gold my house is three times the size it needs to be it hangs off a cliff off of Cuga lake it's spectacular i enjoy living in it and I'm, i read analyses that said houses track inflation for the long term so i said okay i'll tie up that much capital to track inflation that's fine because tracking inflation would be a big win for me if i could just track inflation Mm -hmm. I'm fine. Yeah. It's the fear that I won't track inflation that that, that keeps me awake at night. So that, that's where I, I go. A little um, bit Bitcoin still? A little bit Bitcoin? I'll just a little bit Bitcoin? <laughs> Bitcoin. Uh, nah, I'm not going to buy a little bit of Bitcoin. Uh, that to me is like buying a $10,000 life insurance. Yeah. You're going to go all in. Okay. Well, you know, it, uh, an investment, a Bitcoin investment, to, to, to be willing to bring the anxiety into my world. And the anxiety is not just about what they could do to me, but it's also just keeping track of, it's just so different, right? All of a sudden, it's like when, when I go to the store and someone says, all right, to buy your, your meal, you have to download the app and I get pissed off. I, I don't want to have to download the app, right? Right. And, and I don't want to have to worry about all the subtleties of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so I will have to be committed to Bitcoin to go in there. It's got to be enough to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's it's kind of have a hunch, buy a bunch model. And, and, and until I till I can buy a meaningful amount, mm -hmm. you say I'm not buying it. I looked at it at 10 bucks a coin. So yeah, I, I told me, yeah, yeah. you told Marty, Mar I mean, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, and, and I don't lose sleep over that. I would have sold it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have held on to a it. A lot of people, a lot of OGs, you know, sold, you know, in between and because they thought, you know, it's not going to go, you know, it's just, you wouldn't be the only one. But Well, let me put it this way. If, you know, 20 years from now, Bitcoin is a, is a, in the dustbin of history, mm -hmm. it will be in every textbook. Right. Right. So, so it's not going to be, if, if you had a crystal ball and, and it showed you that future, it's not like it would blow your circuits. Right. Because, you know, it's it's either a revolution or digital tulip bulbs, right? It's, it's, it's there, there's, and I, I try to make every decision based on the assumption if the, if the decision goes terribly wrong, will you forgive yourself? <laughs> Which means, did, was the process correct? Right. Well, I, I was on Hedgeye one day and I said, I made some reference to doing really well. I thought it was a good analysis, unless you consider performance a metric. Right. <laughs> and, 
And but I don't consider performance a metric. I consider the the quality of the analysis the metric. Right. And if you get that right, I think over time you win. Mm-hmm. And if if you know, I owned WorldCom. I own I own WorldCom and made seven hundred percent. Got out. That didn't make me a genius. It, it meant that I was just lucky as shit that I got out. Y two K spooked me out of WorldCom. I made sevenfold on Dell. Um, and 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 you know four or five fold on Warner Lambert and all sorts of flyers. I was a bull and a half in the late nineties, and from the early nineties to the late nineties, and um, and and that was a sign we we're in a mania. Right, right. I was one hundred and fifty percent exposed to equities. Wow, mm-hmm. that's not in my personality right now. Right, there's nothing in my personality that says Dave go leverage. And leverage to me is like taking crack. Yeah, but it was a mania, and I got sucked in. I was 150 percent leverage, and got out. And I don't consider it acumen. I consider it just dumb luck, in which somehow the Lord oversaw my portfolio. Yeah, but it's a mixture. It's a combination. I think it's you were not only, you're not only lucky. Uh, I mean, the way uh, as far as I know you, you know, you're very you know sharp minded and analytical, and you know you you see a lot of things moving around. I think you have a bigger picture of economically and strategically well, i saw the mania i saw the mania i realized we were in a bubble yeah and 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 the beauty of it was i thought y2k was going to pop it right that was so i got the hell out. y2k the beauty of y2k is there was a deadline mm-hmm. there's a time stamp now what happened is i went into gold right and then y2k came and went mm-hmm. but i didn't sell I didn't sell the gold. Uh-huh. I had a short position with Doug Nolan's Prudent Bear Fund, with David Tice's Prudent Bear Fund. I didn't close that out. Uh-huh. And and then I and then what was luck because it was just an inflation hedge. I, I went strongly in around 01, I think it was. It's also vague now. Strongly into energy. Oh, I, I was I was inflation fighting. I thought we we're gonna have an inflation problem. Uh-huh. And I, I think we do, but it didn't show up in the headlines anywhere. Right? So it's one of those inflation problems that was silent. But but I caught the the dozen year energy run. Mm-hmm. And so that created almost legendary performance for the knots. So the decade from January 1st of 2000 to December 31st of 2009, well, Everyone else suffered two pretty destructive bear markets. We're lucky if they broke even. I compounded at 13%. Uh, wow. Now, I fucked up the entire next decade. I compounded at 4% while everyone else was partying. And yeah. so so you say, well, you bone that. I go, yeah. Well, it turns out over the 20, I still was 2% above the S&P annualized. So huh. I just... Would have been, I so wish I had said, oh, Jeremy Grantham, when he said invest in fear, uh-huh. I remember vividly going, oh, no, I'm not buying this market. It's not cheap enough yet. And he Hello. was right. If I had somehow done a balls to the wall, all in equities move, I would be on an island in the Caribbean right now. You know, right. I'm still doing well. Starving academic does not. I'm not a starving academic. Things I think working. physical, you know, commodities, energy, I think these are the things that. Well, uh, it's a tricky play, though. Because, so here's the question. So. Or uranium, I, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> well, the Gehring and Rosenthal, I just trust those guys to know what they're doing. So I just turned it over to them. And, uh, uh-huh. and not a lot of money yet, enough to kind of care. But. Um, but I'm watching carefully and at some point I'm going to go, okay, what I would love is to have sort of a bone crushing downturn. It might not even set the final bottom. It might be Nikkei 19, you know, 85, but I would love to be able to, as I like to describe it gruesomely, you know, cutting, cutting ring fingers off of dead soldiers on the battlefield and pulling gold teeth out of their heads and stuff. I'd, I'd love to be that guy. Um, and I think if we have a really sec- serious secular bear market, you'll have all the time in the world to do it because I don't think it's just going to boink up. It's, the, the dead cat bounces. So, so I, I don't think we're going to have the. I, I don't think we're going to have V bounces. 
We've had V-bounces for 40 years. For 40 years, every time the market sold off hard, you look like an asshole if you didn't buy. Yeah. You look like an asshole if you sold into the sell-off. I think you're not going to look like an asshole this time. Mm-hmm. Well, I think I think you, you'll be able to buy patiently. Right. I don't think they'll. You'll have to rush into it because I think it's going to maul. It's going to maul equity investors. And 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 by the time you will be the asshole for buying. That's that's that that's that you you will be when I was buying gold. There are like twenty guys in the world who thought that was a good idea. What, what, I would what say, price, oh, you know, buying price? gold. What price, what price was it? Uh, I bought from two ninety down to two seventy. Very good. Wow. And then I started buying some more. Went up to around four fifty, and then stopped. Mm-hmm. And then it got to nineteen hundred. Thought I was a genius. Went back to about twelve hundred. And I bought another wad because I thought it had kind of stabilized, and that worked out okay. But um, but someone said, you know, oh, you know, oh, it was easy to buy back then because it was so cheap. And I go, the reason it was cheap is because no one in the world wanted it. Right. No one. Right. The Bank of England was squashing it like a bug. They were they were shutting down the gold market completely. There's about a dozen guys out there saying, oh, I think gold looks good here, and I and somehow I I had bought it and I didn't sell it. I stopped buying at 270 on the way down because I it just the Nasdaq was still kind of running. And so I just I just felt like such a moron buying gold on the way down while the Nasdaq's going up. And but in the end it worked out well. Um and I don't know. I, I think a big whoosh would get me to go strongly into the commodity world. Yeah. Mm. But the problem is that, again, I sort of say the play is going to be tough because. You can't buy, you can't buy a company whose livelihood depends on getting the authorities to let them drill oh, and yeah. let them build a pipeline. That's yeah. dangerous because the authorities that's will shut you down. Yeah, you yeah. need to buy a company that's like a royalty trust in which the infrastructure is already in place, mm-hmm. or you play the idea of a build out and you buy the companies that are that are the drillers, mm-hmm. yeah, the pipeline builders and stuff like that. And I'm not very good at that sort of thing. Yeah, so. I mean, uh, so, the, the real insider and specialist, right? I mean, inside knowledge, huh? I mean, well, or just listen to smart guys. Yeah. You know, if someone like Fred Hickey's ranting about how you really ought to be buying these companies now. Uh, he got me back into gold equities a couple oh, really? of years ago. Mm-hmm. He's ranting about how cheap they were. And, you know, I hate that they're, they're cheap. And then you read some article about optionality, about reserves. I go, you know, I live on a lake, I'm not a fishery. I don't know how to make money with the fish in the lake right in front of my house. And so I don't want to hear about gold reserves. I want to hear about the fact that they can pull it out of the ground, sell it and make money in it. And, and the stock sells cheaply. And so I didn't buy it. And then Fred starts quoting some of the metrics. I'm going, holy shit, that's cheap. Those are tobacco stocks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I started buying gold equities and so far so good. Mm-hmm. But um I bought platinum miners. You wouldn't believe how cheap the platinum miners look. You can't. And I, I, I picked them off a of YouTube where some guy had like a hundred views, mm-hmm. and he went through all the different platinum miners. Really? And went through the went through the the, the 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 their balance sheets. Amazing. And I go, holy shit! He just made a really good case for the platinum miners. Then one day I'm I'm talking about this in a podcast. Yeah. And a guy calls me and says. Uh, Says, well, I'd like to chat because I'm the largest holder of private holder of SBSW, and I want to talk to you about SBSW, which is one of the platinum miners. Uh-huh. I just had lunch with him twice up in the Adirondacks because it turns out we live close to each other up in the Adirondacks, our cabin, and uh, we sat there and just chatted about all this shit. And, right. and the guy's a commodities guru, small shop, not a big shop, uh-huh. and. Uh, what do you need platinum for? I mean, what, what, where is it used? Like in industrial? Like, uh, well, it's used in catalytic converters. So oh, yeah. the one that is that electric cars are not going to do what they say they're going to do. And second of all, uh, I think they're really going to be really important if if the hydrogen fuel cells mm-hmm. pick up speed. Mm-hmm. Um, platinum has gone nowhere. So by the way, the platinum miners look dirt cheap. Their dividend, their balance sheets look great. They've got net cash on the balance sheet. They're putting out an 8% dividend sort of number. 
I'll, I'll buy that all day long if those are stable, but I don't know if they are. And, um, and it's unaided by the price of platinum, which has been flat for 15 years. Mm -hmm. So if platinum ever decides to get legs, wow. those guys get print money. Love, yeah, love your thinking yeah. love your strategy. Yeah. They're making a lot of their money off rhodium. Uh, low time preference thinking. Very good. Yeah. Right. But but the, they're making a lot of their money off rhodium. It turns out there's a, apparently a big meteor landed up in Africa. Mm -hmm. And that's where all the platinum and the rhodium and shit is coming really? from. Really? Jesus. Yeah. I, this is all news to me. Right. And so um, so the bottom line is, is um, Peter Lynch used to buy shit and he'd have to wait four or five years for it to actually start making money. Mm -hmm. He'd go visit, like he went and visited the 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 head of La Quinta, the, 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 the motel chain. And the CEO says, you're the first guy to visit. Come right. on in happily, right. happy to chat with you. So one day, you know, one day I, 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 uh, I was interested in Cinnabon because I love the Cinnabons. And then I was watching Peter Lynch in a documentary, in which he was going down memory lane when he was the legend, the, the goat, and he's walking to the, he used to take his kids to the mall and watch where they shopped. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was eating a Cinnabon and he goes, he goes, oh, this is really good. And I go, oh, you picked up on Cinnabon. So it turned out they went public and I bought them. I ended up not making any money. I bailed on it for some reason. I can't remember even the thinking why I bailed. Um, made a ton off cigarettes, made a ton off tobacco. Um, right before the big lawsuit that they lost, yeah. Yeah, I, I have a issue with cigarettes because I wrote my PhD on the internal documents based on internal documents of the tobacco industry <laughs> on, on the product liability. Um, but uh, because I was, a, I'm an ex-smoker actually. I was I used to smoke well, you know, for, for like ten years, like in my youth, you know. And then I got into, you know, because I studied law and I, you know, anyways, I, you know, I did a, a lot of investigative work and research and went to United States and talked to insiders, whistleblowers. So, you know, I know a lot of about cigarettes. That's what I'm just, just telling you. This. Right. Well, the the that's for me that would be the equivalent of you know not buying a prison REIT. Or 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 not buying a payday lender. Uh, I'm not a big fan of those. Uh, but but the cigarettes uh, they're kind of voluntary. Yeah. Um, and so in any event, though their PEs were ridiculously low. Uh -huh. They were paying humongous dividends, right? Nine to twelve percent for the big ones. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. And they were about to get their asses sued. They were getting their asses sued by this the states for 147 billion. Right. Yeah. Settlement. And I'm, I'm going. They've been ducking this shit. There's no way they're going to go out of business because then the states don't get paid. Uh -huh. And so, so what am I missing here? And I, I labor. I go. This looks like an unbelievably great bottom feed uh -huh. right here. And not, and everyone hated them, right? And then one day I see this little article that says, "By the way, if the cigarette companies lose." lose the lawsuit, they'll have to raise cigarettes 50 cents a pack and pay uh -huh. it off for the next 20 years. I go, oh my God, it's a tax. Uh, yeah. It's not even a hit. It's a tax. That's all yeah. it is. It's a 50 cent a yeah. pack tax. So I bought them and oh my God, did I make a lot of money off that. Yeah. In Austria, I think it's a 75, 80%. Uh, it's all taxes on cigarettes. You know, it's like all kinds of taxes. Well, what, what screwed me up is the cigarette, the tobacco companies bought into the whole vaping thing and overpaid and screwed themselves up. They, yeah. they, should, they should, I, I understand why they did it, mm -hmm. but it turned out to not be a good idea. Uh -huh. And, uh, but, but they've still been kicking out big ass dividends for, for, I don't, it was so many years ago. I don't remember. But uh, but Michael Berry's model is if 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 your investment goes down, it, it it should be if the investment's the right investment, just hang on to it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the problem with that is there's a lot of investments that if they go down, they have nothing to show for it. Whereas if if you have a tobacco stock that's paying eight percent, it goes down, you're still getting that that dividend. I see. Okay. So that model, Michael Berry's model, is there better be a revenue stream. Mm -hmm. David Einhorn's always bitching about how deep value stuff, there's no interest in it. And he and he, he talks about it like, therefore, it's lousy to invest in. And as I, I've said, if if you show me a company with a PE of five that no one cares about, I'll buy that all day long because as long as it's a stable 
dividend because because they're priced to return 20% a year. Yeah, yeah. You know, the internal documents of the tobacco and cigarette corporations, they, they were thinking, because it's fascinating to read, you know, because they were in this crisis mode and they were thinking, you know, cannabis, if they could legalize, like massively lobby for the legalization of cannabis, then it would be, a, I was thinking, I was hoping actually it would go into that direction, you know, at least it's. Well, know. I spent two long phone calls with Todd Harrison and his partners, in which they set up a cannabis fund. Uh huh. And uh, and I eventually ended up not biting, and and the reason was was not because of a lack of interest in cannabis, but and I really liked Todd, but Todd was a derivatives trader at Morgan Stanley, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh -huh. Something like that. That's a short time scale mindset, right? That there's that's a guy who's looking for the quick kill. And I was really worried about getting into a cannabis fund in which it went down. The guy said, oh, fuck it, and sold it, liquidated it. And I go, no, no, I do not want my investment liquidated, right? If, if you own Bitcoin at 20,000, it went down to 10, and then someone sold it out from underneath you, you could be really mad, uh -huh. right? So I needed to go with someone who I thought had strong hands. There's a small cap guy named uh, Eric Cinnamon who I occasionally chat with. Uh -huh. And he listened to every conference call. He asked questions. These are all these micro cap level. And he's got a fund. What's really interesting is that he is 80% cash. Right. I'm paying Eric not to invest his money yet. And, and I think Eric knows these small caps. I've sent him small cap ideas that come across my doorstep. He doesn't. I, I think if it's not once he follows, he doesn't care about it. He always thanks me, but um, um, but I still figure he can at least take a peek at it and say, oh, look at that. That is interesting. But he he listens to hundreds of conference calls a year. Really? Uh -huh. And and that's the guy who I want investing in uh -huh. small caps. And I can't do small caps at all. And so um, so I try to find the smart guys, try to find the, you know, the the guys who really wait until they see the whites of the eyes and who really understand what a buying opportunity is and what's just a sucker bet. Yeah, you need a real deep insight into all these facets and aspects of, you know, of, yeah. I mean, my 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 wife, uh, you know, she's a chemist actually from my background, uh, you know, lots of background and she's, she's very, used to be, you know, also specialized in cannabis, hemp and THC and CDB, CBD and, you know, and she wants to develop her own product also. Well, my wife is into cannabis too, but really? on, on another <laughs> level, on an altogether another level. Um, here's a question for you. How many prominent deep value, how many prominent guys can you name who actually talk about the markets, not in terms of technical language like momentum and money flows and crap like that but rather in terms of just valuation real valuation not relative valuation not saying oh this is going to do better than this i don't care they both get crushed i don't care if my got half crushed right that's the problem so how many guys do you know who really look at absolute valuations and talk and do do graham dodd sort of analysis and look for cheap I'm not good at names, but the only, I mean, I'm not even sure about, you know, I probably heard about Lena Alden. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, she's real good, but but she's more like, is she like more into ETF? I mean, I mean to, into what do you call it, funds and, and more like emerging markets, but I'm not sure whether she's like in specialized. Uh, I'm not so, sure. so the language you get, someone like Jeremy Grantham speaks in yeah. a pretty damn bad language. Jesse Felder, um, John Hussman, these are these, very few, though. Very few, exactly. Very few. And, you know, when someone, when someone shows me the market and some trend line that goes back to 2019, my God, you couldn't be more wrong, in my opinion. I want a trend line that goes back to 1900. <laughs> yeah. I, one of the questions I like to ask is why a lot of people put upwardly sloping trend lines on valuation. Uh -huh. you know, why should the valuation trend upward? Exactly. Oh, did you hear about um, the guy is a genius. I mean, there's a, even a wonderful documentary about this guy, Armstrong. Armstrong. I think he used to be, wasn't he like in prison or something for some time? Armstrong. Martin Armstrong. Martin Armstrong. Yeah. Armstrong. Yeah. The guy is a real. I communicated with him when he was in prison. No and, way. and his his daughter would get it. 
And then, you know, it wasn't deep, meaningful stuff. But okay. It was, it was just. I, what do you think about this guy? I mean, is he really? Uh, uh, I can't tell. I, I mean, there's guys who are so outside the box. You go, wait a minute. You've lost sight of the box now. Uh -huh. Right, and so Martin tends to get into the geopolitical stuff, which I really like, but I, but I don't like it for investing. Uh huh. Yeah. My yeah. investing is different than my, you know, Jeffrey Epsteining, <laughs> and uh, and so I, I don't know the guys who predict crashes. Uh, crashes don't correct anything. Uh huh. If if someone somehow thinks, you know, if someone thinks that we're going to have a plunge and that's going to correct anything, they're dreaming. The way you correct markets in earnest is you grind the investors to dust. Uh -huh. That's what that and I here's here's the problem. I think a lot of people think that uh, Powell is attempting to curb inflation. I think Powell's attempting to curb speculation. Wow. Uh -huh. Now, if I'm right, that means he's not going to let up until the markets tell him to let up, uh -huh. which means the market's got to take a beating. Uh -huh. And then the question is, does he have the control to then somehow take his foot off the throat? Or when he takes his foot off the throat, do you find out you suffocated him like George Floyd? Right? So so interesting metaphor, Dave. Um, so I think Powell's not going to let go until the, until the speculative furor is, has been drained out of the markets. Oh, that's a... Uh, or near all-time highs. Uh-huh. It, it makes no sense. The, the economy got completely hosed by COVID lockdowns. Right. Everything's wrong with this. Everything's wrong with this picture. They talk about a recession. They go, oh, we're going to have a soft landing. You know, if, if you're talking about a landing, it's never soft. Right? The fact that you had to land, a great quote is that you'll have enough fuel to get to the crash site. Um, and so... so there's some real smart guys who see just horrors ahead of us at some point, unknowable point. Uh -huh. So I'm not alone. Um, I had a funny exchange. I'll tell you, sometimes I wonder. I had a three-way with Larry Summers and Stephen Roach by what? email. Really? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I've communicated with those guys often for years. That's I funny chat late at night by email with Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> we would swap emails late at night when we were both bored. Um, but uh, uh, um, Roach said, I said some blah, blah, blah about the markets being fucked, just to start the conversation. Roach said it's going to be like landing, it's landing this economy is going to be like landing on an aircraft carrier in a typhoon. He says, might be soft, but I don't think so. <laughs> and, and, and Summers chimed in and said, I pretty much agree with Stephen. And, uh, and, uh, so they're smart guys who see crash landing ahead, but yeah. crash doesn't mean fast. I think it's got to be slow. I think I think you have not corrected the markets until you've corrected attitude. Mm -hmm. If if everyone's looking for the next dip, if everyone somehow thinks you can't be hurt if you just buy and hold, you got to get them to the point where they go, I "I'm not touching equities again. This is just this is painful." That will be the 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 the, the low when when I people see. are swearing off, like they swore off gold, right? Like they swore off tobacco. The reason energy is so interesting because I so I was in energy. I, I actually got saved a lot of money because Cornell booted me out of my energy funds. I didn't even notice because I don't watch my my own accounts. I have some screen I watch. Uh -huh. I didn't know that a year earlier they'd kick me out of energy. Um, I'm pulling a life cycle fund. Um, so it saved me some money. And I asked some hedge fund guys, should I go back in now knowing this? And they said, no, and I didn't go back in and that saved me some more money. But then I started going back in when they kicked Exxon out of the Dow. And at about the same time, Felder said that energy used to be 16% of the S&P and it's now 2%. I go, both of those are bottom calls. Both of those are screaming, scream. You can't have an economy that has 2% of, of, of the investment in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so that it just, it had to be the start. And so, so when I started buying energy, if, if it was the bottom, I, I caught the bottom, right? It, it was the best bottom grab I've ever done. But I, I bought it because, because energy was hated. Mm -hmm. I don't even know why. 
I don't know why. Well, didn't help when barrels of oil were selling for minus $37 a barrel. That was a little detrimental to people's attitudes. But um, so, yeah, if you put a gun to my head, said buy something now with a lot of money, I, I'd buy an index. I'd buy a fidelity fund on energy. Right. And something have like a headache. Yeah. Yeah. Not deal with a headache. Yeah. And then sleep at night. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I like dividends. This this uh, share buyback is a replacement for dividends. Oh my God, does that make me gag? <laughs> they're taking they're taking on debt. They're but taking they're they're buying overvalued shares to buy back their their own to buy. They're taking overvalued. They're taking money off their balance sheet to buy overvalued shares to boost their stock options. <laughs> what a con! It's, it's a reach for yield, right? Yeah. If your balance sheet was getting 5% or 6%, which it now is, uh -huh. you would be a prudent runner of the company and say, okay, well, we, we should have a cash hoard uh -huh. and it'll sit there and collect 5 or 6% while we wait for the next opportunity. But when the interest rates got to zero, then it's like, well, we're getting killed on our balance sheet, so let's buy back shares. Oh, let's take on debt because debt's so cheap. So now we have this huge corporate debt bubble because we bought back shares. Now it's got to roll over. Mm -hmm. It's sitting at horrid interest rates by comparison. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to have a collapse of, 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 of corporate debt. We have to have a disastrous corporate debt correction. Right. Because all those all that debt we could look at look at a boot up a plot of corporate debt. It's horrifying. It's horrifying. And it, and you just to take a look at, I don't know, European Union, Germany, Austria. I mean, it's just the, the number of... It's all over the world. Yeah, it's falling apart. Everything is just crashing. Yeah, they had negative rates over there across yeah. the pond, yeah. right? Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if, they, if I wouldn't be surprised if if we have if we experience uh, if we have the crash here first in the European Union, the Euro, whatever. I mean, the, the number of insolvencies, bankruptcies, it's mind boggling. It's anyway, it's and they haven't really picked up steam yet. Yeah, they haven't. No. But but so for example, our housing bubble doesn't appear to have burst, although one could argue its burst is just a slow motion burst. Right. But, but when 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 you got mortgages at under three and now they're at seven, mm -hmm. you by definition can only buy about half the house you could have exactly. bought, which means yeah. therefore the housing market's twice the price it should be. I don't know. I see a horror scenario. I don't know. I don't I don't think it takes lot much longer to be honest with you. I think I mean how long do you think <laughs> this whole thing can uh, you know kicking you know and down the road. I mean it's like what is it? One, two, three years? I mean uh yeah they I'm could giving up you know pred predict what or when not both right yeah yeah and I predicted what not when mm -hmm. it yeah. feels like it's close mm -hmm. I, I think I think we're I think we're in a recession at some level. So, so you know how the how how the labor market is tight. Mm -hmm. Some idiots call it a strong labor market. I go no, no, because the actual labor participation sucks. Yeah, it's a broken labor market because the guys who are selling their labor and the guys who are buying their labor aren't coming to terms. Right. Exactly. Yeah. If if you were selling cars and the buyers of the cars and the sellers of the cars couldn't agree on the price. You got a problem for that industry. Uh, and so so I think we have a tight labor market that that's causing the illusion of a strong econ a stronger economy than it really is. Uh -huh. And as a consequence, I think at some point we're going to wake up and say, just because you can't hire at Walmart doesn't mean the economy's rocking. Because <laughs> we could be in the depths of the depression, uh -huh. with the exception of San Francisco. Walmart's going to still have to hire people, uh -huh. and and so um, and so I think the the employ um, oh by the way the recent employment numbers something like nine hundred thousand part time jobs and negative five hundred thousand full time jobs that's a disaster, or as the meme said, Karen what's her name the press secretary what's her name Karen yeah, yeah I forgot sorry but yeah whatever press secretary yeah. Um, she said, the, the Babylon Bee said that uh, the economy is doing so great. People have twice as many jobs as they used to. <laughs> oh, they, they create the most. <laughs> yeah, the bee is phenomenal. So in any case, anyway. yes, we agree we're doomed.
Dave, yeah, it was really great talking. I always learned so much from you. Anyway, um, by the way, you know, my final thought was, you know, what I think what America, you, you, United States needs is like, super, like they, they have to bring out like super new technologies, advanced development, you know, innovative technologies. And then like, I mean, it just, it needs a total retra it needs a transformation. Well, but the problem is a lot of the new technology looks like illusory wealth to me. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so there's a book by Robert Gordon, which I hype a lot. And it's something about wealth creation. If you go on Amazon and search Robert Gordon, it's on wealth creation. It's a, just a brilliant book. And Robert Gordon says between 1870 and 1970, um, 1940, um, excuse me, 1870, 1940, I think. No, no, 1970. Uh, wealth creation was spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, and then it went really pretty flat from 1970 on. Went went much shallower from 1970 on, and it went flat uh -huh. at some point with a slight bump between 95 and 2005 when when tech sort of showed up briefly to give it a boost. But but there's you know Nvidia trades at 45 times revenues. What a stupid market that is. Facebook could go away today, and no one would notice it missing. Obviously, people who like Facebook would. But it's not like the world would come to a standstill because Facebook went under. Tesla could go away today. We wouldn't notice yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. um, so NVIDIA, Tesla, Facebook. I noticed Nikola is still in the market. Holy crap, that didn't go down. Uh -huh. um, Microsoft's gains over the last, I'd say, 10 years were probably five-fold increase in valuation. Um, um, the, 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 um, the 10 stocks that are driving the 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 Fortune 500, the S and P 500 stocks, yeah, are all these puffy stocks? Are all yeah. these stocks elevated on a blanket of air? And um, and uh, and 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 what bothers me is not that ten stocks are driving the market, but rather that there's 490 stocks that are returning nothing. <laughs> there are some within that that are, but I, that collectively the, yeah. the, the S and P 490 is returning nothing. And so the question is, what kind of economy is it? What kind of market is it when the 490 of the biggest companies in the United yeah. States return nothing? Yeah, it's a bubble. And if you're making products and making money, who, where's that money going? And the right. answer is not to investors. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the Cantillon effect. Yeah, the Cantillon effect. Yeah. There you and it, it turns out the guys who own the company and the big, big money guys, the wealthy and powerful, they're getting it by the time it gets down to Joe Sixpack. Why do we have to make money? Exponential loss of purchasing power. Yeah. Right. We don't have to make money because we don't have a voice. Exactly. Yeah. The indexers don't have a voice. And so there's 490 companies who don't have to answer to anyone for not, for not providing payment to the owners of the company that are down the food chain. Yeah. And so it, this too shall shall come to an end at some point. <laughs> yeah. So Dave, um, uh, any other publications coming up or articles or besides Twitter? Uh, I'm going to do another podcast with Tommy Kerrigan, Tom Luongo, and, and Jim Kunstler. Those oh, are awesome. always Tom they, Luongo. They get rock. I respect this guy. Yeah. Um, I'm supposed to hype my year in review on Amazon, even though it's free on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, for 20 bucks you can you can pay to read it um and also what's a little more interesting is um my 2009 to 2012 year in reviews were mm -hmm. I, I didn't put them up there turns out bob moriarty put them up there he, he did the, all the work and just said click here click here it's now up on amazon um, i think his goal is to actually produce the entire anthology from 09 to that would be amazing yeah we should bring it out as a book yeah or as a documentary we well, the, the books are the books are, are 300 pages a piece the uh -huh. 09 to 12 and the 2022 uh -huh. they're each 300 pages yeah and so it'll be about five or six volumes of 300 pages talking about whatever crawled up my ass that year. <laughs> no, it's and, a, um, it's and I said, that doesn't sound pedestrian and, and trivial and sort of naive. And he said, no, not at all. Not at all. No, no. Well, I haven't read my years in review since I wrote them. 
<laughs> really? Okay. Well, go to Amazon. If, think of it as a Patreon contribution. Buy buy one, you know. Yeah, definitely. They're yeah. not over formatted. They're not, you know, they they got uploaded and they're kind of rough because there's little glitches that appear and things like that. But That's true, I don't want to authentic. <laughs> I, I don't want to oversell it. I figured out how to get the glitches out finally, but. Um, no, I love your work. We all love your work, Steve. So uh, I hope, yeah, we, we can do this again, maybe in whatever, six, 12 months time. Yeah, yeah, when something changes. Yeah, something, maybe. I have a feeling <laughs> something's gonna change, but I don't know, it's it just my- It feels like it. Anyway. It's not gonna be for the good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dave, thank you so much again, okay? Talk to you soon. See you later, bye. Bye.